We're good to go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning. Good. Um, so thank you very much for attending this meeting, and we're going to call this meeting to session. I don't know if we officially call it, but we're going to start. Uh, the first thing we'd like to do, I, just a quick couple of announcements. Again, remember if you have phones to make sure that they're on silent. And we will be taking breaks as allowed. Um, we do have a fairly full agenda today, so if we need to break at some point for lunch, we'll make that decision as we go along. But looking at what's up there, it's a possibility that that might happen. We can start with introductions. Uh, Samantha Stoniker, Tarrant County College. Tom Wynn from UNT Health Science Center. Set Alma De Leon, University of North Texas. Alan Pixley, Collin College. Lisa Fox um, with Texas, um, <laughs> I can't even say my name, but <laughs> with uh, TASFA. Carla Flores, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Robert Marino, San Jacinto College. Diane Todd Sprague, University of Texas at Austin. Chad Pulse, Texas High Education Coordinating Board. Denise Welch, Panola College. Marilyn Abadrabo, Collin College. Uh, Charles Ed Caressley, Angelo State University. Bridget Jans, the University of Houston. Kara Tappendorf, Pflugerville ISD. Terry Shenman, Fort Bend ISD. Shannon Crossland, Texas Tech University. Kelly Stillman, Amarillo College. Do we have anyone on the phone? Uh, Pamela Fowler, University of Michigan. Presenter. Christine Stewart Carruthers, Texas State Technical College. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do want to remind you that if you are going to speak, make sure that you hit your button so that the microphone is on so that the recording can pick up your voices. So the first call of business today is consideration of approval of the minutes. I hope you all have had a chance to read those. Has anyone any comments relative to the minutes? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to consider the minutes approved. So second bis third point of business is the prior FAA business from Chad Pulse. In looking through uh, prior minutes, uh, the only piece that I saw to update you on is to just let you know that um, we got a, a nice big pool of uh, nominations for the Financial Aid Advisory Committee um, this year. So I'm working on uh, the usual process that I do of trying to make sure we have geographic re representation and sector representation and system representation and all those different pieces of the puzzle. Um, and so we'll put, be assembling a slate of nominations um, this summer um, for people that are going to join for our November. Um, I'm One of the things I'm pleased about, um, the feedback that you all gave um, in helping us think about how to reach out to school districts. Um, we definitely seem to have hit um, something right this year because um, we got over half a dozen nominations um, from different school districts. Um, so that was an area that uh, we were very pleased about. So just want to let you know that uh, we are moving along on that and we look like there's no reason we won't be able to fill all the slots we need to fill. Oh, another piece that I should mention um, is, I can't remember if we formally mentioned it in the last one, um, but Shannon Crossland has joined us as a member of the Financial Aid Advisory Committee to fill one of the vacancies um, for someone that had to step down from the position. So uh, I, in fact, had completely forgotten until she showed up today, and I apologize, Shannon. <laughs> so. Shannon, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, Chad, I just realized when I had looked through the minutes, I forgot to mention this. In the, pre in the minutes in the presentation from Trellis, they did have a comment that um, met, we had members had asked for clarification of data differences on slides referring to COA and that Trellis will review this and get back to the members. I don't know if we've ever heard anything back or not. 
At this point, I haven't received anything from them, so once I get something, we can send it out to everyone. Okay, um, could you possibly ping them again and just Consider see? them pinged. Oh, <laughs> Brian, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Moving on, uh, D, presentation on ethical dilemmas with cost of attendance, and we have both Pam and Mary, or both <laughs> Pam and Mary, great. Pam and Mary, thank you for coming and want to take it away. Mary, are you there? Diane, do you see the uh, PowerPoint presentation? We do not, and we also are having a difficult time hearing you. Your voice is very low. Is that Mary? Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, can anybody else hear us? We, we're having to strain a little bit. Okay. Is this any better? Not really. Okay. What about me, Diane? Can you hear me? Um, we can hear you. It's not great. I'm standing on top of my telephone. I don't know what else I could do, and it's all the way up. My volume's all the way up. I don't okay. Know what else I could do. Yeah, me too. Could it be a sitting in the room? Because I'm on the phone and can hear him clearly. I I'm sorry. I don't know what you just said. Um, the volume is really clear for those of us on the phone. Is there a way to turn up the speaker in the room? Okay, we're working on that on our side. Okay, can you all see your presentation? I see something's loading, so that's good. I okay. can see Yay. it. I can see it. <laughs> okay, well, we've got that. We are moving in the right okay. direction. Okay, That's so you right. should be able to control your presentation. Okay. We will try and be very, very quiet on this side <laughs> so that we can okay. hear you. Mary, I'm going to let you drive the whole presentation. Okay, sounds good, Pam. Right. I'll go ahead and start then. Is that okay, Diane? You ready? Yes, please. All righty. So just to, to um, kind of open everything up, we did go ahead and um, uh, actually present this very similar presentation um, prior, to, uh, prior to this time at the National um, Financial Aid Administrators Conference in, um, uh, in, in Austin, Texas last year. So you're going to see the slide deck. We give recognition to NASFA because NASFA was the organization that kind of kicked us off in doing this presentation. Um, and our goal today is to just do a very brief overview of sort of the, the 30,000 foot level conversation about cost of attendance, but then also to delve into some of the ethical ramifications of cost of attendance and how NASFA as a national organization of financial aid professionals has been advocating for um, for best practices among its members in developing cost of attendance. So I'm going to flip a slide and see if it's going to work. Yay, okay. So here's here's a little, um, for my colleagues who are, that are financial aid administrators, this is um, going back to boot camp and reminding ourselves about the importance of cost of attendance. Um, cost of attendance matters for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, it is the way that um, it's certainly one of the most important com components for calculating financial aid eligibility. Uh, Title IV financial aid and then how our state aid and institutional aid comes into play into all of that. The next um, aspect of cost of attendance that's so important that's really more relevant now, I think, given the current environment in which we're operating in higher education, is that it is one of the ways in which we help students and families understand how much it costs to attend college. I'm so going to interrupt you. 
if I can interrupt you real quick, just so you know, we're having a little trouble on our end with the slide deck. So if you oh. could just let us know what slide you're on so that we can follow okay. in our handouts, that'd be great. I okay. think we may be one slide behind you. Okay, I'm on, I should be on slide five. Five, yeah. Okay, we're there now. Okay. Hang on a minute. Okay, sorry, I had a little issue. Um, so in NASPA's uh, approach to training financial aid administrators about cost of attendance, the sentence that you see on the slide above is sort of like our lexicon. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, what we think are, is sort of the best overall description that provides our guidance and um, sort of like our, our path as we develop cost of attendance in our financial aid offices. So we wanna provide students with something that is as accurate as possible and reflects reasonable cost. And obviously we, we can't always get at both of those things. So, um, so cost of attendance is always a sort of a, a, an effort in financial aid offices that is a moving target. And I don't think any of my colleagues in the room with you all today or my colleague Pam would say that we ever get it perfectly correct, but we're always striving to be as accurate as possible. And we always want to be reflecting not um, exorbitant costs or costs that are low-balled, but costs that are reasonable. So we can move on to the next slide. So the primary cost to attend should be the slide that you'll be looking at here shortly, I hope. Um, and the, the primary cost to attend are those that um, are generally pretty easy to identify as aid administrators, those are the costs that are established by the institution. So our governing bodies, our board of trustees, our campus leaders are those that are helping us establish the cost of the attendance for the institution and tuition and fees is obviously the biggest one. Um, on campus room and board, for those of us that are at institutions where we have housing, um, uh, students living on campus, eating in our food service, on campus room and board is typically established for us. Books and supplies is always something financial aid offices, financial aid professionals are estimating. And um, books and supplies are something where we're going to be um, 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 using um, various forms of data to help us determine what is a reasonable and um, as accurate as possible reflection of the cost students incur for books and supplies. That's been certainly evolving and changing over recent years with everything from book rentals to book vendors like Amazon and Chegg coming into play and then the, the, the substantial movement to get away from textbooks to more online access for students. And then finally, um, financial aid offices have to include, by regulation and statute, we have to include loan fees. So if students are borrowing federal direct student loans um, to access college um, as part of their financial aid package on the cost of attendance side, we do have to reflect the loan fees that are, as of today, still part of the direct loan cost. So we'll move on to the next slide. Additional cost to attend. So this slide is gonna reflect the costs that are included in cost of attendance, but may not be for all students, maybe just for some students, depending upon the student's individual circumstance. Um, some will be reflected in all. Again, it just depends upon the student. So the, the non-institutional costs are the costs that aren't obviously established by the institution. That'll include things like transportation. So the cost that students will incur to get to your campus or um, um, to travel from a home base to your campus periodically if they live on the campus. So students incur transportation expenses. Books and supplies, again, I mentioned those previously, typically not established by the institution, but have to be developed um, in some reasonable approach by the financial aid office. 
Personal miscellaneous expenses are things like soap and detergent and shampoo and um, the things that students run up to Target or Walmart for. That's how I describe them on my campus when I'm working with my parents and students. Um, so our students primarily live on campus and so they are going to be running up to get personal expenses. This can also be um, things like occasionally going out to eat with friends, things like that. If a student um, is incurring costs for childcare while they're in, engaged in academic activity, the financial aid office will include childcare uh, as an allowance in the cost of attendance as well. This is a component of cost of attendance that will depend upon the student situation. So some institutions will automatically work in a childcare expense um, for all of their students that they identify as parents. Some may um, do it more on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's an area where financial aid administrators will make a, a, maybe a different judgment call based upon their student population. Um, and then um, the other component of cost of attendance that can be non-institutional is if you don't house your students on campus and they're living off campus in, in apartments, renting houses, things like that, Room and board is on occasion a non-institutional cost when a student isn't living on your campus. So these are the primary, most common components of cost of attendance that financial aid administrators deal with. So we'll move on to slide eight now and just talk kind of broadly about how cost of attendance is established. Uh, and I just kind of, again, I'm trying to do sort of a 30,000 foot overview and um, want to describe kind of generally um, how institutions will go about establishing their cost of attendance. This is primarily a responsibility of the financial aid office. Financial aid offices may collaborate with other offices on campus, um, housing, institutional research, business and finance are, are common partners in helping us establish cost of attendance. The cost of attendance um, is is easy to establish for the things that the institution sets, as I mentioned previously, tuition and fees, on-campus room and board. Typically, those are given to us by some somebody in charge on our campuses. But the other components typically require the financial aid office to do um, some additional legwork. And ideally, what we recommend, um, we being NASPA through our training material and sort of the recognized best practices in the profession of financial aid is that financial aid offices have to determine for those non-institutional costs a standard approach that's articulated in a policies and procedures manual that will describe how we're going to determine what is a reasonable book and supplies budget, for example, or what is a reasonable transportation allowance. And I've mentioned on the slide some of the resources that we use to do that. Bureau of Labor Statistics, College Board data, oftentimes original research that occurs on the college campus can be helpful. On my campus, we just finished this past year a student survey that was specifically focused on off-campus room and meal expenses. So for our students that were living in apartments or renting houses, we wanted to get a good, accurate idea of what those costs were like. And we used an actual student survey to do that, that we um, pushed out through the financial aid office and analyzed internally. Sometimes you may partner, a financial aid office may partner with a faculty member to help them with that or with institutional research to help us with that. So if we go on to the next slide then, which would be slide number nine, it's just a little introduction. Cost of attendance has gotten to be a pretty hot topic in our profession 
And if we can just even skip right past slide nine and go to slide 10, um, I'm going to reference a study that was done um, and published in the Journal of Higher Education back in March of 2017 that um, certainly raised some eyebrows within the community um, and on our campuses um, that uh, has uh, become sort of uh, the, the starting point for a lot of discussions for many of us. So um, this article was written by um, three pretty highly regarded um, researchers that do a lot of work in our area, and it was entitled Cost of College Attendance Examining Variations and Consistency in Institutional Living Cost Allowances. So this was focused specifically on what we would call the room and board component. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, slide number 11 for me, um, you will find that the primary findings of this study indicated that institutions that were in the same geographic area would have very different room and board allowances for students that were essentially living in the same areas. And so for if you think about a metropolitan area, um, uh, uh, Minneapolis, I think, was one of the focus communities of this study. Um, the researchers found that institutions that were within the same geographic area, in some cases within city blocks of each other, had very different room and board allowances for their students. And the second bullet, which describes sort of generally one of the key um, findings in this study, indicated that nearly half of the colleges providing living cost allowances were either at least 20% 20 20 above or 20% below the estimated county level living expenses that the researchers found developed by standard um, cost of living um, reporting agencies within that geographic area, whether it was um, uh, something through the Bureau of, of Labor Statistics or state-derived data or even city-derived data would, would indicate that apartments generally cost, it, cost this much per month, and that wasn't consistent with what the financial aid officers were using. Either um, they were using costs that were too high or too low in the opinion of these researchers. Now, financial aid administrators generally would We suddenly lost you, Mary, Pam, are you there? I'm here. But I don't hear Mary either. Mary? Pam, do you want to pick up? I will certainly try and do so. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, this this study, and you have to you have to remember that just because your county and your surrounding area has one set of costs, that doesn't necessarily mean the institutional area would have the same cost. For example, Ann Arbor is in Washtenaw County. Anything else in the county of Washtenaw, or even in Wayne County, for that matter, our costs are much higher. Is that Mary? I'm here. Sorry about okay. that. Go ahead. Uh -huh. The authority to establish cost of attendance lives with financial aid professionals, and financial aid professionals often report to enrollment managers. Enrollment managers have a job, which is often to generate revenue. And so the insinuation a little bit of the study was that is cost of attendance manipulated, either to increase enrollment by reflecting lower costs to students, or is cost of attendance manipulated to be higher than average to increase um, the capacity for financial aid within the financial aid award. And these were extremely controversial this was an extremely controversial statement that caused a lot of discussion among the financial aid community. And I'm going to toss it over to, Sam, over to Pam now, and she can talk about the work NASPA did in the area to address that particular concern. 
Okay, good morning, all. Uh, yes, I was part of a NASPA group that was called together on cost of attendance. I was also part of a Brookings Institute uh, group, and it was another group. I can't remember what the name of it was, but we all talked about this thing of cost of attendance. So Mary's right. There is this perception out there that we are not doing a good job of this. And I think some of that goes back to the fact that many of us don't document properly how we are setting the cost of attendance. So if you're not doing that, you need to do that. You need to be able to pull out the um, the survey that you do, show how many people and it responded to the survey, was the survey broadly uh, distributed to, to your students, not just one part, one part or whatever. And as Mary said earlier, we are also thinking of breaking up our cost of attendance so that we can focus on specific issues in, uh, in the cost of attendance and maybe help get us better data. Um, but these competing pressures on schools, and I can understand, I can understand that because years ago when I worked at Eastern Michigan University, in the state of Michigan, you have Eastern, Western, and Central, all very, very, very similar institutions. And my enrollment management person at the time wanted to make sure that my cost was not significantly higher or lower than Central and Western. We all had to be basically the same so that students wouldn't think that they were going to get something at one that they weren't going to get at the other. So that's a very real uh, situation that many of us have to have to deal with. Um, so we were looking at items already in the calculation of the ESC that do not belong in the cost of attendance, which many people don't understand. You know, medical expenses are in there. And when they say that they've had someone in the family get sick, they don't understand that we can only take into account those expenses that were not covered by insurance. And if you have insurance, most of them probably are. And what is not covered is probably already in the calculation of the EFC. So we sought to address problems of access versus excess and this per per pressure to manipulate the cost of attendance. Now, this kind of came to the four years ago when the F the NCAA allowed schools to pay for miscellaneous expenses for athletes. And that was an interesting uh, set of events. I went down to our uh, athletic office to talk to our um, athletic director, and I told him that my goal was to treat all students the same. And now we all know athletes are not like all students, they're special, but okay. And I said, we allow students to have uh, additional um, transportation expense because when, when we do our um, cost of attendance, we ask students for their local transportation and many of them report nothing, which they should because buses are free in the city of Ann Arbor, the, the university's buses or the city buses. You can ride any of them just by showing your ID card. And we had already gone through and divided the country into regions or sections and attached to that cost of attendance for going home and coming back four times a year. So we would add that onto the cost of attendance uh, for students who, who requested it. So I went down to tell the athletic director that I would do the same thing and that we had a form for this, but the form also had um, things like books and uh, child care. It had uh, transportation. It had other types of occurrences for which we would increase the cost of attendance, and he immediately said, no, I need one that just covers transportation because I, if I give them this, they're going to check all the boxes and say they need money for all of these things. So we had to create a separate form just for athletes to get at their transportation costs for the year. Okay, going to move on to 14. The group did not address tuition and fees because that's probably the one thing we don't need to um, uh, determine how we set it. Tuition is what it is on your campus, and you can either use actual or average. And the, the NASA monograph has a se section on tuition and fees, and we recommend that everyone read that. Uh, for those of us um, that are on PeopleSoft in, at Michigan, the cost, the tuition cost is in the registrar's table. So that's controlled by the registrar. So tuition here isn't set until hopefully this month. Uh, third Thursday of the month is when the board meets. But we've already packaged a 
everybody probably by that point. And since date and time is not a reason to for there to be a difference in one person's call, uh, the courses the student is enrolled in. Okay, number uh, slide 15, general recommendations. Um, cost of attendance should not be used as a vehicle to achieve institutional goals. I think we all agree with that. On the other hand, as Mary said, there is pressure for you to do whatever your enrollment management group thinks needs to be done to help them uh, achieve those enrollment targets. But it should not be used for that purpose. Um, and we we point you to NASA statements of statement of ethical purposes, um, which says a breakdown of individual components, uh, you know, all billable charges. The whole ethical principle statement should help you when you're trying to um, counter that particular argument that you need to do something else. Okay, general recommendation two, slide 16. A uh, good practice, institutions separate the components that are combined in practice and in statute. So when you construct your um, cost of attendance, and hopefully you put this on your award notice, um, you will have broken out, this is what tuition is, this is what room and board is, this is what transportation is, this is what miscellaneous is, and this is what books is. And it also should be prominent in your consumer information, and that for most of us, that's our website. Slide 17, general recommendation three, institutions that clearly indicate exactly what expenses are included um, in your policy, in your construction policy, in your consumer information, and in your professional judgment policies. Now, professional judgment is probably a session or two or three on its own. Um, but in many cases, when a, a professional judgment decision results in an adjustment adjustment to the student's cost of attendance, something that you can pay for. And this gets us to one of the big problems I think most of us have on campus is the student that takes their refund check and they're living off campus and they're supposed to use that for their living expenses and their food and their light and everything else and they send that money home. And then they come back into your office and say, I need more money. And you ask them what they did with it, well, they sent it home to their mother or their father or whatever. And you can't do anything at that point. You cannot give that student money for an expense that you have already covered. So you go into, well, what did you spend on your books? And do you have this? And do you, and you think about all these other little extra things that are not in your cost of attendance and in an attempt to help to get that student more money. That's one thing. You may not even have the money to give to the student, even if you can take those extra things and come up with a number in which you can increase that student's cost of attendance. So you're in a real dilemma there. And the only thing you can tell the student at that point is they have to find a job or they have to tr try social some social service or whatever to try and help them out. But that is a really big problem, and it's a problem that, unfortunately, we cannot solve because of the regulations under which we work. Okay, transportation. I talked a little bit about transportation. Approaches to developing a transportation component. This is one area where you will find a wide range uh, among schools, among schools of the same type and of basically the same type of location. Uh, you survey your students. Um, how many trips are you going to allow home from campus to for non-residents? Um, how are you uh, accounting for uh, local travel? And uh, real and understand that nine percent of the um, income protection allowance is for transportation. So theoretically, whatever you include should be above that nine percent. And I don't think most of us uh, actually do that when we are constructing a cost of attendance. Okay, personal and miscellaneous. An informal survey found annual allowances in this category range from 475 to 5795. Now, one would think, what in the world would create such a wide disparity in what colleges are given to uh, students for personal and miscellaneous? And, and in some cases, it may just be a number because most of us don't have the money to meet full need 
anyway. So we aren't we aren't even most of us probably aren't even covering direct costs, let alone direct and indirect costs. But I would hope that whoever's giving fifty seven ninety five and who's only giving four seventy five would have good rationale and good data to back up those numbers. That is probably the question. But and for most of us, personal items include toiletries, clothing, as, as Mary said, things you buy at Walmart or Target or whatever. And and even though most students would disagree, we do throw some entertainment in there. It's probably not you know the kind of entertainment they, that they want, but we do recognize that you know all work and no play, bad thing. Okay, your survey may reveal some additional items that you have not accounted for, but each should be reviewed individually and carefully. So if something pops up, if you've got a survey where you can fill in the blank or write in, and they come up with something really, really strange, uh, you need to research that. Is, you know, is this something that this student only remembered to put down, or they're only incurring that expense, or are there other students on your campuses that are incurring the same kind of spent expense? Okay, number 20, dependent care. Uh, professional judgment is not required to add dependent care to a student budget. However, guidelines are needed as to the amount to include in the budget. Okay, the cost of caring for a dependent child or parent so the student can attend class. And the workforce recommendations that we came with that was we covered the care of the children to age 12 or under. And by exception, children up to 19, if there are special needs for that child, and they should be considered. And we recommend that you require a licensed child care provider. And that's for basically the safety of the student and the institution. So something happened to that student in the care of that provider, and the university's money was used to pay that expense. It's not a stretch to think that the university could be liable if something happened for the student. So we recommend a child care provider, and you run into a lot of pushback from that because grandma or grandpa or aunt or cousin, whatever, may be taking care of that child. If they are not a licensed child care provider, we at the University of Michigan will not pay for that. And to be sure that we are not, we do a random sample of all of our child care providers and write them and ask them, is this student enrolled in your child care facility? Now, paying in advance for this is best for the student. Uh, however, this method offers you little assurance that that is what the funds will be used for and intended. Now, at the University of Michigan, we give child care grants. They're not intended to cover the entire cost, but Michigan State gives you $1,000 a year. Our maximum is probably something like 6000 a year, depending upon how many students you have in child care. Uh, but it's just a, another valid expense um, that you can um, include in your cost of attendance. The next would be a computer. Now, um, most schools will take a computer. Any computer will do. A good computer will do. But then there are some of your um, disciplines that want a specific computer. At Michigan, it's music and art. And you have to buy the computer to their specifications. The art department, you must buy it from art. The $4,000 computer, which in this day and age is to me sounds kind of ex excessive, but that is what the computer costs. And if you are going to get a degree in art from the University of Michigan, you must have that computer. Um, and the other one is music. And it's not all music, but only certain disciplines within music that have to have a computer. And so we know what those computers cost. But for the student who just gets a computer on, or wants to buy a computer on their own, they may get it from a computer store on campus that you're institution is running, that's easy to determine how much the computer is. But most of us, uh, for those other students, we ask them to bring in an estimate, you know, print out what it is they want, what it's going to cost. That is our documentation, and we will increase the student's budget for that. But another thing that you need to know to, to establish in your policy is how many computers does an undergraduate get? How many computers does a graduate get? Uh, because you will have students that will come in and want to buy one every year. You give them the money to buy it, of course, and then, of course, they turn around and sell it to someone else. So that's, um, that should be um, something else that you look out for. So for most of us, it's one for an undergrad and one for a graduate. If a student goes beyond a master's to a Ph.D. program, we'll look at a third uh, computer for them. 
okay, room, housing. Your policy states what type of room you consider standard. Uh, so a lot of times when students move off campus, they, they think that they can live alone. And our budget, I don't know about yours, but our budget requires a roommate no matter where you're living, on or off campus. Uh, and we recently had uh, our student, central student government did their own survey of living expenses because their uh, contention was that we were not giving them enough. And when we looked at their uh, responses, they were the same as ours. But they wanted to present this to the Board of Regents that we needed to give them more money to live, and we found one gigantic flaw in their methodology, and then that they took an eight-month budget, which is what we have, and assumed that it was for 12 months. And when we corrected them and said, no, this is for eight months, and when you took their figures and adjusted them for eight months over 12, we were happy to see that they were right in a line with what our survey data had showed. So we were giving them enough. We just don't give them enough for those term, those months in which they are not enrolled, which is the summer. And we understand the students have to sign a 12-month lease, but they only get financial aid for eight or nine months uh, that they are enrolled, unless, of course, they enroll spring or summer term or whatever. So it was good to know that they had the same information that we had had. But we tell all students, that you must have a roommate and um, we include the, the utilities are in there, and the, and for commuters, um, we will give them uh, an amount, but we don't have very many commuters here. Students either live on campus or very closely off campus, but we will increase transportation for a student who's doing student teaching and may have to drive to that location. Uh, so that's another thing you might want to consider. Uh, we also do not include security deposits, so that might be an, a, an issue for a student. Um, can you think of some other way to include, increase that student's budget to allow them to pay a, a deposit on their room? And can you get that money to them earlier? Uh, earlier than, than most of us disperse 10 days before the term, the student may need that a month before. So if you have institutional money, you could disperse enough for them to have a, um, to pay their in, uh, security deposit on their uh, um, apartment. But most of us that don't have that aren't able to cover that cost up front. Okay, meals. On campus, there are multiple meal plans. What is the standard and what is the average? Um, on, on campus, I would say most of us probably have no less than three different meal plans. And then there's, there's, uh, there's limited meals, and then there's all meals, and then there's meals at Michigan. The, the, most expensive plan has, uh, I think, six guest meals and $300 a semester in meal money that they can use at other places, not necessarily the dining halls. Um, and I remember when we were in NASPA and I said this, and one of the NASPA employees says, well, you shouldn't be funding guest meals. And I looked at her and I said, that's the plan. I fund the plan. What's in the plan? I really don't care about. But I can't take those meals out. And there's no way to me to determine what um, dollar value they've given to those guest meals. And that's what the student's going to be charged. And that's what I give them. And this is another component that was driven by athletics. You may recall years ago, there was an athlete who was in a, a football player, was in a bowl game and said he went to bed hungry. Now, there's a lot of re reasons for that, uh, but a lot of people said, oh, we're starving these athletes to death. And Sarah Gold Rabs, uh, uh, her research would lead everybody to believe that we're starving all students to death because we're not giving them enough in the cost of attendance. Well, we all know it's not the cost of attendance. It's the amount of aid. We all can't meet needs. So, yes, we do acknowledge that we're giving the students less than what we need. they need, but we give them all of what we have. Uh, okay, so we give everyone on this campus, because the athletes got the largest, uh, the most generous meal plan that we have, so I gave it to the athletes and I gave it to everyone else. So students can get a meal plan only if they're living off campus, um, or they can buy their own food. And, and in places like Ann Arbor, there is no local grocery store. There's a little store down the block from my office and I wouldn't buy anything in there because it's grossly overpriced. So we tell students that you need to get on the bus 
and go down to Walmart or Meyer or Kroger or whatever and buy your food because we're not giving you the kind of money to pay uh, ridiculous prices for your for your food. Okay. NASA's Code of Conduct and Statement of Ethical Principles. Uh, the Code of Conduct says information provided by the financial aid office is accurate and unbiased. And I also served on a NASA committee where we where we had complaints from people that were violating one or both of these. And I would call the aid office and say, well, you know, I don't see a breakdown in your cost of attendance anywhere on your website, and it's certainly not in your award notice. And they would point out to me many times that I had only been given part of the information that they sent to the student and not all of it. And had the student read all of the information, all of those things would have been there. But I think we have all had experiences with that in the past. Uh, and institutional award notifications and or other institutionally provided materials should include a breakdown of the components. Now, what I think we really need here is some way to come up with potential billable charges. If you've ever answered the phone that in the week of August uh, at your institution, that's what parents want to know. How much do I need? How much am I responsible for paying? And if you have a, a, uh, an estimated bill that goes out that will show estimated financial aid, and that would give the family an idea of what they're responsible for paying. But um, here at Michigan, there's some things that are never on that estimated financial aid. Private loans are not on there. If the loan has not been originated for a student, it will not show up. So, you know, even that is not 100% effective, but I hope we all have some way of letting parents know before they move that student in um, what they're going to be responsible for paying. And that's basically what uh, families want to know, is how much am I responsible for, what do I have to come up with, and if you can do that, that would be best. Um, slide 25, uh, the statement of ethical principles, you strive to ensure that the cost of attendance components are developed using resources that represent realistic expenses. And we tell you, we expect you to live like a student. Now, maybe you have never lived like a student, but this may be the first time someone's told you to do that. And this is what you tell the students who come in and want to know why you won't pay for a maid service and why they can't board their horse. Uh, but that is not part of the educational experience. Um, and we, we don't want you to go hungry. We, we don't want you sleeping on the streets. But on the other hand, we don't want you borrowing in excess uh, to um, support a lifestyle that is not what we consider a student lifestyle. And that is about all I have. There are some resources to help uh, that we compile for you. And uh, I guess we can take questions now, Mary. Yeah, certainly. Any questions? I, I don't ha necessarily have a question um, for the two of you as much as a comment. Um, I really appreciate your time this morning doing this, and I know that this is a very difficult conversation that when the committee was meeting, there was representation from all the various sectors, and that there are a lot of issues to be considered with the various institutions, and it's extremely difficult to come up with one size fits all. This exactly. is very tough. Absolutely. I mean, one of the guys on the committee, the NASA committee, owned a proprietary school in New York, and his room and board allowance was $2,500. Now, I think all of us know that $2,500 in New York, Manhattan, is unrealistic in any realm. But that's what he gave. And I, he was doing it to keep his costs down, to keep his borrowing down, to keep his default rate down, and all those other things. And I think we all fail to understand how all of those government things play into how much aid we give. If your school is having a difficult cost of attend uh, default rate problem, you may lower your cost of attendance to keep your students from borrowing more. That is not the intention. But some things, can, you can be forced into doing some of these things in order to keep keep your doors open. And, that, that, and yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah. 
just want to um, kind of tag on to what you just said, and that was the thought that I had um, at the FSA conference uh, in Atlanta last year. There was the discussion about limiting borrowing, all of that, and the suggestion that was even made by the Department of Ed, well, you have an ability to control your cost of attendance. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's another dilemma that we have. Um, and, um, you know, what you had indicated is uh, schools saying, hey, what options do we have if the Department of Ed is saying you have to offer all the loan eligibility a student has and, mm -hmm. you know, you can't only give them limited amount or uh, seek to limit what you have determined they're eligible to receive and cost of attendance is the component that determines that. Absolutely. I had a question, um, Mary, Pam, uh, both of you can answer. Um, do you do surveys um, in order to help establish your cost of attendance? And if you do, how often do you do them? We just finished ours. We do them every other year. And one of the really strange things that came out this year is that the cost for a sophomore is much higher than anyone else. If you have a sophomore living off campus, they're spending a lot more. And we couldn't, we have been racking our brains trying to figure out why that is. So my um, senior associate director went over to the student services and they have a, a group of called Beyond the Diag, which is a supposedly a group of everyone who will rent to students. And what they found out is that if you, if you sign a lease early, you may be on the hook for $1,500 a month. But they maybe say July, late July, early August, and they've got units that are not rented, they'll drop that to 1000 And of course, the sophomore doesn't know this because they're just not savvy enough. And then a, a sophomore hasn't had the time uh, to develop good relationships with other students. So they may end up in a rental share agreement with people that they know but don't know well, and that could create problems with them when something happens and one of them moves out and leaves one student holding the bag for everything. But we're still working on that. Why are the sophomores spending so much money? Our, bu our budgets are perfectly fine for juniors and seniors, but sophomores tend to report that they're spending more. At UNK, the University of Nebraska at Kearney, where I am, um, we uh, have developed in our policies and procedures manual sort of a, a calendar of when we do original surveys. So we try, we um, we alternate survey years, but we we have a targeted survey. Um, for each component of cost of attendance. So I just mentioned we just did a survey for living expenses off campus because we were trying to get a good a good sense of our off-campus um, room and meals. Um, two, two years prior, we did one focused pretty exclusively on books. And, and prior to that, we did one on personal miscellaneous expenses. So we, we have that kind of articulated in our survey. One of the things we've heard from financial aid administrators, especially those at small schools, is that it can be really difficult to do research, um, original surveys and research all on your own if you don't have a really big financial aid office, if you don't have a lot of institutional support. So sometimes a staggered approach makes some sense, and if it's articulated clearly in your policies per and procedures and you do what you say you do in your PNP, that, that can be a good approach. That's absolutely true. We use the, um, our Institute for Social Research here at the university. They're, one, they're in the next building over from us, and they have been very, very helpful in helping us design our surveys. And we are thinking of uh, busting it up as well to try to get, especially the sophomore issue about what they're spending their money on. Um, I have a follow-up question. So on the, and I understand, Mary, what you all are doing. So Pam, since you do it every other year, kind of on the off year, are you increasing by a percentage at all? Um, or how are, what are you doing on the years that you don't do a survey? We, we do increase. Uh, first of all, our uh, room and board is, uh, is the same for on campus and off campus, because we have pretty Ours expensive is room and board around here. So that we uh, is increased every year by whatever housing inc increases their cost. So like this year, be four percent. So that will go up four uh, percent. And um, in the off years, we either talk to the School of Business or the Institute for Social Research and get the inflation rate, and we'll increase those other things by inflation. 
Now, let me tell you, we do we do meet full need of all non resident all residents at the University of Michigan. So, anytime I increase my budget, I have to get an increase from the provost in my grant aid. And my grant aid right now is something like two hundred twenty million dollars, which is a lot of money. When I first came here twenty two years ago, it was just a little blip in the budget. Now it's so large you can't miss it. So. Everybody's focused on how much money they're giving me for financial aid. So we came up with one year where we wanted to increase personal miscellaneous by, I think it was $450, and the provost didn't have the money to give to me. So we um, we settled on 250 and then the following year we raised it 300 to try to, to, try to catch up. Uh, but that's, that's one of those issues where something other than what the real costs were determine my cost of attendance. And the, my last question, and I'll give other people opportunity, but um, what do you do to incentivize completion of your surveys? We give them um, a gift card that I overlook. <laughs> but if you don't, we put everybody's name into a hat and we'll draw four of them out and give them I think it's $50 gift card to um, Meyer or Target or someplace like that. And we do, we do exactly the same thing. And, um, you know, we're kind of, we've been pleasantly surprised by that, the participation. It, it's, uh, and I don't, I don't know if it's just because these kids from the middle of Nebraska, we serve a, a, a you know, a very Nebraska centric and they're just very polite and they think they need to do everything they're asked to do um, expediently. It generally they'll do that. So we've been pleased with our response rate. Anybody else? I have a follow-up question to that. What time of year, this is Shannon with Texas Tech University, what time of year do you administer those surveys? Do you do, where, do you do it in the spring or where you get the best response? We do them in the fall. We do them yeah, in, the we do fall it in the fall as well. Before they forget what they, <laughs> what they spent their money on. <laughs> Very good, exactly. thank you. Like thank November. You. Same for us. I have a question for the committee members um, in relation to cost of attendance um, and the you know, issues that have been brought up about you know, differences and things like that. Um, is there anything that you think that the agency um, can be focusing on, should be focusing on that would assist um, institutions in relation to this matter and you know, trying to make sure that um, the cost of attendance um, is an accurate um, piece. I don't know if there's a role that we can or should be playing with you all. I would just say a gut check um, is always the uh, cost information that's on the College for All Texans. Uh, I always refer back to that and say, where do I place on that? And I fall within a reasonable range of the average as well as, you know, looking, um, if you look at all public institutions, but then look at maybe regional publics, for me, go, yeah, I think you know, we're, we're in the ballpark. Uh, nothing is an outlier. So that is a great resource that you already provide. I might also add in Fort Bend ISD and other school districts across Texas, we refer to that website all the time because it lists every expense that's, you know, possible and reasonable. So all of our kids know what they're getting into and not just tuition. And I think the College for All Texans website um, this past year when they issued new guidance on what tuition figures you should be reporting uh, was very helpful because it made it a little bit more level. So that was very helpful. Okay, anything else? Pam and Mary, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, take care. Yep. Have a great day. I do need to confirm um, that these members are on the phone. Paul Galen. Heidi Granger. I'm here. Okay. Jonathan C., the student rep. Hello, I'm still here. Great. And Christine Crothers. I'm here. Wonderful. Thank you all. 
Okay, moving on to the next agenda item, uh, external relations. Is someone doing this for John? Yes, sorry. Lizette is going to be assisting us today. Good morning, Lizette. John is on a plane away from here right now. Good morning. Yes, John's getting to know his children again after session. Um, so I'll be providing, hi, I'm Lizette Montiel. I'm the Assistant Director for State Relations. I, I'm sorry, oh, is your microphone on? Yes. Okay. I think so. Can you hear me? This is Paul. Thank you, Paul. Just got in. So I'll be providing a brief update on key uh, financial aid outcomes of the 86th legislature. Um, as you know, uh, the legislature adjourned sunny die on May 27th. Uh, Governor Abbott has until June 16 to sign or veto bills passed during the regular session and to line item um, veto budget items. On the budget, higher education sector did fairly well, or did very well. Um, specifically, on a Texas grant, they uh, funded an $80 million increase. Uh, so we estimate this level of funding to continue to serve 70% of newly eligible students at the current $5,000 target award. Uh, the coordinating board had recommended a 2.5 um, increase in the target award amount, but that was not funded. As you know, Texas Grant um, is one of our, you know, primary financial aid programs, and we really applaud the legislature for their continued investment. Moving on to slide four, uh, other key financial aid programs also experienced a boost this session, while others held steady. Uh, funding for the TOG at both community colleges and state technical colleges was held steady at FY18-19 funding levels. Uh, the Texas College Work Study was also level funded. Uh, the tuition equalization grant was increased by $6.8 million from the previous biennium. This, re this reflects in part a shift of funds in the baseline appropriation from the beyond time private budget strategy to TOG, TEG. The Texas Armed Services Scholarship Program received a substantial increase uh, uh, over FY1819 levels. So the award amounts for the TASP have currently been uh, around $4,000. Um, the legislature increased the funding to move it back to the higher award levels from um, last few years uh, at $10,000. The amounts for the beyond time public and private represent the estimated demand for these programs, which are limited to renewal students, as you know, will seize awards in FY21. So the legislature also passed significant higher education legislation that will help advance the state's 60 by 30 goals. Under uh, the leadership of Representative Wally, Chairman Turner, Senators Powell and West, the legislature adopted House Bill 3808 to create the Texas Works Paid Internship Program. Um, you may be familiar with this program. Uh, the coordinating board has recommended the Texas Works Program for two sessions now and uh, finally got it done. So the bill removes the off-campus requirement for the college work-study program and creates a centralized uh, process at the coordinating board for us to work with employers across the state to offer high-quality uh, paid internships to students. Um, there are no, there's no new funding for the program, but we intend to use uh, funding from the existing college work-study work uh, program to fund it. Another major piece of legislation was Senate Bill 25, which aims to facilitate student transfer. Uh, this was one of the Lieutenant Governor's top 30 priorities for the session. Uh, it was authored by Senator West and Chairman Turner in the House um, and involved uh, stakeholders from both community colleges and universities um, coming together to the table. It does several things. Uh, some of the major provisions of the bill uh, is a reporting requirement, so requires uh, universities and community colleges to report to the coordinating board uh, courses that were taken by students, transferred to another institution, and not accepted for academic credit. 
Um, and there are other more specific requirements for community colleges. Uh, so basically the institutions have to report to the coordinating board. We would put that uh, data together and analyze kind of where the challenges are in student transfer and report to the legislature. The first report is due March 1st of 2021. Another uh, provision of the legislation is what we're calling co-admission. So as part of the Apply Texas application, students would be able to indicate their consent for sharing their application with another institution if they are denied admission to a specific program. So if you know a student is denied admission at the business school at UT Austin, they could check the box and UT Austin would be able to share the student's application with another institution that could potentially admit the student. The filing of a degree, de degree plan, um, that was also one of the coordinating board's recommendation. It's in several pieces of legislation, including Senate Bill 25. Um, one of the pieces of legislation, Senate Bill 1324, was recently pa um, signed by the governor. So it reduces the number of hours in which university students must file a degree plan from 45 to 30 hours. And it adds a new provision that requires dual credit students file a degree plan after completion of 15 semester credit hours. Um, recommended course sequences. So institutions are required to develop at least one recommended course sequence of lower division courses for each certificate and degree program offered and include that on their course catalogs and online. Um, institutions are also required to report that to the coordinating board. The idea here is for um, the coordinating board to post all the course sequences in one central location to help students um, navigate through all of them. Um, there's a provision, provision regarding articulation agreements. Uh, institutions are allowed to enter into our articulation agreements and extend existing articulation agreements to other institutions. Um, and then finally, there's a study on uh, yeah. core curriculum and meta majors. So the coordinating board is tasked with um, convening an advisory committee of two-year institutions and four-year institutions to examine the core curriculum and potentially splitting the core curriculum into a general core and an academic disciplinary core. Uh, there was some discussion of doing that in the bill this session, uh, but universities and community colleges and stakeholders could, couldn't come to an agreement as to how the core should be split exactly and how many hours should be in a general core versus an academic disciplinary core. Um, so the legislature decided to um, require the coordinating board to convene this advisory committee so we can then provide uh, recommendations to the legislature next time. I'm just gonna jump in real quick. For those of you who are calling in, if you could make sure that your phones are on mute, we're getting a little bit of feedback here. Thanks. Regarding the graduation supplement, I think you've been hearing from John Wyatt. Um, so the coordinating board had recommended the legislature allocate a portion of the university's formula funding um, based on undergraduate degree completions, particularly at-risk students. Um, it became clear to us that the General Appropriations Act was not going to include this graduation supplement, so we worked with Senator Zaffardini and Representative Theory to introduce Senate Bill 1504. Uh, this would require unused funds in the Beyond Time account to increase graduation success for at-risk students. So ultimately, the, le the legislation requires institutions to spend proceeds from the account on initiatives such, such as intrusive advising, academic support, and other methods to increase at-risk students completing undergraduate degrees. Um, the account was set to abolish in 2020, and it's the legislation extends that to 2024. So they haven't appropriated the funding, so the next legislature will then decide how to appropriate those funds. That makes sense. Senate Bill 1474 by Chairman Lucio and Chairman Murphy was a group effort by stakeholders to, who participate in the private activity bond space. Uh, the coordinating board has been limited to $75 million 
annual cap per bond issuance, and this extends or expands our authority to uh, 200 million or 6.8 percent of the available state ceiling. So. Um, if we didn't make a change in statute, it would be difficult for us to continue to meet the student loan demand for our loan program. And so this is one uh, piece of this legislation. It also addresses other uh, entities that participate in the private activity bond space. Just a few others. Uh, Senate Bill 499 by Seliger was included as an amendment to Senate Bill 241. It really just uh, clarifies that institutions are not required to include private student loan information in the statutorily required uh, loan debt disclosure that was approved last session. House Bill 2140 by Representative Niave and Senator Powell uh, requires the coordinating board to establish an electronic submission portal for the TASFA through the Apply Texas website. Uh, the coordinating board is required to appoint an advisory committee of financial aid personnel and representatives of students to assist in adop adopting procedures and implementing this legislation and also um, providing recommendations to the legislature on how best to improve this uh, provision. House Bill 3, as you know, is the um, school finance legislation. Part of that uh, bill requires high school students to complete and submit a FAFSA or TASFA prior to graduation. Uh, there are some exemptions uh, if the parents uh, decline and sign that you know, they're choosing not to, or if a student is um, over 18, they can do so themselves. Um, House Bill 766 adds disabled firefighters as eligible recipients of the disabled peace officers exemption and makes the exemption mandatory for institutions. It does have a cap though, so um, the governing board of an institution may not provide these exemptions to students enrolled in a specific course in a number that exceeds 20% of the maximum student enrollment designated by the institution for that course. That's all I have today, but um, I'm available if you have any questions. I'm just going to add a couple quick follow-ups to those items on pieces that I'm guessing you'll have questions about. Um, one is in relation to the work-study funding. Um, we're going to be using a million. She mentioned they're going to be using a million dollars from the current allocation, um, the or current appropriation. The preliminary figures that had already gone out already accounted for um, that. Um, million dollars going to Texas Works. Um, so the preliminary, you, the numbers that we sent out previously won't be affected um, by the Texas Works passing. Um, uh, second question that I'm guessing you'll have is when are we going to get final allocations? And we are targeting June 18th um, to send those out, barring any last minute um, data concerns or anything um, from institutions. Um, the governor has until the 16th to sign everything, and so our goal is to send it out um, on the 18th. Um, and then also in relation to HB 2140 and the creation of the online TASFA, um, I just checked the statute and that is effective for the 22-23 academic year. Um, and so um, that's, that's when we'll be targeting getting that up. College Readiness and Success will be taking the lead on that um, creation. Um, it is in the statute, it specifically is to be created using the Apply Texas platform. Um, and so, and they handle that. Um, they have developed that over the years, and so they'll be taking the lead on that. A advisory committee will be established specifically for the creation of the online TASFA, um, and that will just be for uh, uh, the period for creating on that online TASFA. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, um, but we will definitely be including regular updates in the financial aid advisory committee um, agendas um, for meetings going forward to make sure we keep you up to date on um, what's going on.
online TASFA, um, as well as to get any feedback um, that you all have in relation to that. So those were some of the things I thought you might have questions about, so just wanted to toss those in. I, I do have one question. Um, on the piece with the debt letter mm -hmm. that was added on to the other amendment, uh, what time frame, that, does that become effective September 1 for the 2021 academic year? I'd, um, I'd have to check on that. I believe it's what was immediate the, effect. What was the number on that? I forget the bill number. Bill 241. Chad is going to look it up. He's so. And I believe um, we've sent out several communications to, to institutions clarifying that this is already the case, so it shouldn't change very much. Um, it further just clarifies the intent of the legislature. Thank you. Once I find it, I'll let you know. Um, I had a question on the requirement for FAFSA and TASFA for high school graduation. What if they don't? <laughs> um, this is obviously up to the high schools to facilitate. Right. Um, if they don't sign a waiver and we have no documentation that they've done a FAFSA or a TASFA, what, is, what are the consequences? And is it to the school or to the individual? I don't believe there are consequences outlined in the legislation. It's simply a, a requirement for graduation. So that would be... So they would not be able to graduate? Right. And there are provisions in the bill um, for um, parents and students to be able to specifically sign off that they're not going to be um, filing the FAFSA. Um, so there are provisions for that. I'm a little confused on the timing of all of that. So the colleges right now are assuming that students are going to graduate and are admitting them on that. At what point in time, I, I, is this something that will be developed then in policy? At what point in time high schools would notify us that the student's in fact not graduating? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I was trying um, to figure out the cycle with things opening like October 1, but and, and also because we have some school district people, if, if y'all talked about any type of procedures on this or what you'll be doing to collect, but also kind of that timing. Well, I'm wondering, is it going to show up on, I mean, what's going to happen to the transcript? Is it suddenly going to say, I'm sorry, you're not graduated? We've had to add a lot of things to the transcript uh, because House Bill 5 and endorsements and so forth. This will be another thing to add to the transcript, and we've cut our current transcripts in Fort Ben ISD that could be as many as seven pages long down to two, but looks like we're going to be continuing to add things onto it. Um, <clears throat> I think as a school district, we're going to have to get our heads around how we're going to how we're going to track this. Um, that's that's something that can't. We can verify who has done the FAFSA. But the bookkeeping involved on who signs a waiver um, and why, that's, that's going to be a challenge. It'll be another piece of paperwork that we have to do. How, how is it easier for you to know who signed the FAFSA versus the form? I'm just curious. Apply Texas. Okay. Apply Texas. However, if they don't do an Apply Texas application, we can't track the FAFSA. We can only track it if they do a Apply Texas application. How do you track it through Apply Texas? I'm sorry. Apply Texas actually has um, a tab that you can click on the student, look at their college applications that they've applied, and you can also see their FAFSA status. Can. If okay. it's been um, re huh? not, not requested, but uh, Submitted, flagged for review. Submitted, flagged for review. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a very, very nice tool to have as a school district. So the point is then for all the schools that are now going with the coalition app, you would not have that information. We are currently in Fort Bend, we only have a handful out of 6,000 seniors that have used the coalition app. Uh, that's been yet another hurdle for us, so we're sticking to the common app or apply taxes well, or a or a private app. Just to warn, like UT Austin just started coalition last year. Go to day and M. And I think that we're going to see more and more of our students going that way. 
Nationwide right now, the um, I think there's 140 partner colleges nationwide uh, compared to Common App, which it, we're trying to make this as easy as we can for our students, and another application has made it more confusing for a lot of students, and we have not had the support from the coalition that we do with Common App. So that One may be things, something oh. that you want, I'm sorry, maybe something you want to address. We've been on, on coalition for three years, so that may be something you want to talk like to our school about and, you know, maybe that we can go back to coalition and talk to them, you know, about maybe some additional efforts in, in that respect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things our intent really on the coalition was primarily for out of state students although in-state students can use it, but like in my office, when we talk to students, we actually push them usually to apply Texas if they're from Texas. And there's only been a few that we've run into uh, where the coalition app was the only choice. Usually the schools that we've seen that have the coalition as, as one of the choices, they also have apply Texas or out, out of state have the uh, common application. So there have been choices with the exception of a few. One of the things that, oh, you might be about to say. Oh, I'm sorry. So the Commissioner of Education is tasked with appointing an advisory committee of school counselors and administrators and others um, to develop rules to implement this specific section of HB3, and they're required to um, give the legislator recommendations by January of 2021. Uh, did she say when it's in effect? I was just looking that up. I would imagine after that. <laughs> One comment that I would have is that I would hope in the end, whatever happens, that for higher education, a graduation is a graduation. So we don't have to look to see, okay, they graduated and they completed the FAFSA or they signed the waiver. If that high school uh, determines that that student graduated, that should be enough for us as, in higher education to say yes. It's To me, it's the school's, the high school's responsibility to make that determination and that's a, that's a, um, part of the graduation, just like um, uh, the, the star, is it the star exam? Mm -hmm. like I mean, we don't check to see if that happened. To yeah. Um, also, we have, we have families in our district who just will not do the FAFSA, period. Um, maybe they feel like they can afford this without any help and it wouldn't do any good to do the FAFSA. And where the TASFA is concerned, we have a lot of families who will just not do that for fear and and requiring them to do that as a as a part of graduation it's going to put the school districts in a bind um my two cents but i think that that's why they gave an escape clause for that too so i mean i'm, I'm glad they're not really forced to do that and the timing of it will go in conjunction at least with electronic TASFA. Which yeah, so be this, a, a this specific provision would apply beginning with students enrolled in 12th grade in the 2021-22 school year. So it, sh it would apply with students enrolled as seniors in the 2021-2022 school year. Which aligns nicely with the online TASFA, which takes effect for those 22. students would be applying to the 22-23 um, academic year. I think all these pieces are good pieces for us to make sure that college readiness and success is aware of um, because even though TEA leads the charge to make sure that this is in place, um, the pieces that the counselor suite and Apply Texas and online TASFA that might 
um, be able to benefit um, that. I don't know whether or not there's any opportunity that potentially the um, the sign off the waiver piece um, might possibly be able to be integrated into something like Apply Texas or um, Online Task Force or something like that, so that that way um, institutions aren't schools aren't having to each do their own piece. Um, so this feedback is really helpful. Was there any indication of a timeline like a student doesn't do their do their FAFSA TASFA and one year later they do? I mean, can they be graduated at that point in time? I, I don't know if there was any language that allowed it like a cutoff when they had to have that completed by or 10 years later you could go back and suddenly graduate from high school. Uh, the requirement in House Bill 3 is, is pretty broad but again it leaves it up to the Commissioner of Education and this advisory committee to come up with the details on on how best to implement. One comment and then a question. Um, I mean, I think all of this shows there's lots to be thought through as to how this is really going to work. Um, I think there's an opportunity, though, as I think of uh, us in higher education, um, where we can be a resource to high schools more than we already are in helping schools help their students complete the FAFSA. So I see this as an opportunity to maybe open the door to more high schools to allow us to come and be a resource uh, because now it's something that they need done. So I mean, I and I think, you know, for us to prepare to take on that opportunity, I think is, um, is one that maybe we need to bring back and say, hey, can we have more resource? Can we have more dedicated time to be able to get out and help high schools meet this requirement? Mm -hmm. um, then the question, uh, I know there was also proposed legislation about somehow tying completion with dual credit and those where we as institutions had dual credit within high schools that we would be required as schools to assure that that's, that didn't move, that's not part of this legislation. It's kind of, in a sense, all on the high school to document that the students have fulfilled this requirement. Is that true? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. I, I guess I want to have one final comment, and that is that um, while I appreciate the concept of making sure that as many students as possible file the FAFSA so that they can see if they're eligible for aid, I would, it's very difficult for me to reconcile that with now the potential barriers to education that this could be creating. So as folk go forward, I would just advocate that you think about as many ways as possible to assist these students so that they can pursue higher education without another barrier. I had one last comment. We, we have about 35 to 40 percent uh, of our students complete the FAFSA by June that shoots up to 60% and above in August when they find out they can't go to school without a loan and they got to get a loan through FAFSA. Um, this is going to force us to move, kind of like the FAFSA uh, application opened up October 1st, this is going to keep moving up to where we have to start <laughs> in middle school planning on financial aid, which is not such a bad idea. Uh, just to follow up on the question you asked, the loan letter legislation takes effect September 1. Okay. Uh, and all of this is based on assuming the governor doesn't veto any of these. Yeah. So. And, and again, I, I do thank you for that. Um, I know that technically I think we all have been going that way, but now we understand that the legislation is very clear on it, and that's, that definition is helpful. So, Chad, on, on that, though, would we... I mean, I understand from our last meeting that the interpretation from the coordinating board is that private loans were not part of that anyway. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so. that's that's been the coordinating board's interpretation all along. Is just that it it was limited. You know, the statute already indicates that it's limited to things that to which you have reasonable access to. Um, so our interpretation had always been. You know, it's only the extent to which you have reasonable access to the information. If there's no other comments, I'm going to ask that we take a 10-minute break. Everybody agreeable? Great. Uh, let's reconvene at 1110.
Well, we are close to having everybody back, so I think we're just gonna get started again. Um, Chad, you are up next. I am, and Deshay, I'm just letting you know I told you around, you're up under G, not up under L. Okay, <laughs> giving you the heads up. <laughs> um, in terms of the Texas grant report, I don't have a, a slideshow or anything, although sh it is the, the report itself is up here. Um, just wanted to update you on a, a few things. Um, you have, we had sent out the uh, draft um, materials, so we'll be finalizing that for the board shortly. Um, we did streamline the report this year to um, focus specifically on fulfilling statutory requirements. Um, if there's anything from prior versions of the report that you found useful but aren't included this year, um, be sure to let me know because one of the things we're looking at is you know, having streamlined this report, we're also looking at assembling some smaller, like two-pagers that really highlight aspects of um, this program as well as we're looking at the same thing with the financial aid reports um, so that we can really try to draw attention to particular items rather than a whole bunch of stuff getting lost in a big, huge report. Um, so I would encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to read through it and, and let us know of, hey, what happened to this piece? We really liked that. Or, um, you know, if there isn't anything that you say about that, then it's probably good that we streamlined it. So um, some items specifically that I'll be highlighting with the board, um, you know, we highlighting the fact that there was the $80 million increase in funding, um, $40 million per um, year, um, which should allow us to stay, you know, the state to maintain the current level of funding 70% of students eligible for an initial award. Um, one particular piece that I'm gonna highlight um, from the report is on page two. Um, and that is the enrollment pathways section. Um, that is a, a new piece um, of the report. And what we're looking to do there um, is to really kind of highlight what's, what are the different pathways. Um, that was one of the major discussions during this legislative session, um, was looking at what the different pathways are um, not only the percent of individuals who are eligible through that pathway, but the percentage of Texas grant recipients that are actually getting funded um, through each pathway. And one of the discussions that we'll be having during the interim before the next legislative session is looking at that discrepancy between eligibility and awards um, to see if we can identify any opportunities, any changes to be recommended, et cetera, um, as how we might be able to close that gap. Um, so for example, I think it's most notable in the, the final column for the TEOG pathway, um, you know, in three years, you know, the first year we had 2.4%, now we're up to 8.1% of all eligible students are through the TEOG pathway, um, but only 0.4% of Texas grant recipients come through that pathway. Um, so even though that pathway is created, um, it's not something that's really providing students an opportunity um, to be funded. Um, so that's a piece that we definitely want to discuss um, over the coming year and a half um, to determine whether there's any recommendations um, for us to make. One of the things that we particularly appreciate your help on um, was from your all the hard work and the willingness that you had um, to implement the updated FAD um, process um, because for the first time we were actually able to identify the extent to which the military pathway is utilized for funding. Um, we still can't identify the percent um, or we can't identify people who were eligible through that pathway but we can at least identify um, how many people are funded through that pathway. Um, and right for this for 2018 um, it was I think it was less than five individuals um, were funded through that pathway. Um, so we're gonna be looking at, are there other ways for us to be able to get at data, um, either through other agencies or the like, to try to understand how many students would be eligible through that pathway. Um, but in terms of awards, it's definitely a minimal approach. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna highlight with them the fact that the Urban Institute has identified Texas 
as one of two states um, where Sandy Baum and Kristen Blagg are going to be conducting studies um, to identify opportunities um, for potential improvement within the state grant programs. Um, so they're going to be doing a deep dive into our data um, to look at what, you know, what do we currently have structured, what are the goals that exist, um, how does it appear that the programs are achieving those goals, um, are there opportunities for improvement um, that are focused on those goals, et cetera. Um, looking at one of the questions um, that has come up is looking at um, pieces that are focused on achieving goals versus pieces that are more rationing devices, um, all those different pieces. So they're going to be um, studying that um, over the course of 2019 and 2020. Um, I believe their funding ends at the end of t um, 2020, so we should definitely have something um, from them in time um, to help us as we talk about the next um, legislative session and whether there might be recommendations that can be made um, for improvements. Um, another piece um, that, uh, not that I'll be mentioning to uh, the board, but to mention to all of you that's related to Texas grants, um, is that we've had some inquiries lately about how the four different priorities for Texas grants all relate to each other, because um, there's the priority deadline, the priority EFC, the priority model, as well as the priority for renewal students. Um, and so we're in the midst of working on some additional guidance um, and having discussions internally as to, you know, do certain um, priorities trump other priorities, et cetera. Um, and so we hope to be able to provide you with some additional guidance, but it likely won't be until this fall that we're able to kind of hash through all the um, statutory interpretation, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to let you know that that is something we've gotten inquiries on and we are working on that. Any questions about the uh, Texas Grant Report? Okay. Hearing none, I guess we're moving on to um, the TASFA subcommittee, Robert? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the data sub collection. That was to Shea, right? Hi. <laughs> Can I go back just real quick? I'm sorry. Was there anything particular when, when you all looked at the data that stood out to y'all particularly? Um, the I would say the pathways was the, the pathway. piece that mm -hmm. really stood out. Mm -hmm. um, most of the other things that we look at, um, when we look at how things are disaggregated by EFC or by race and ethnicity, um, those stayed very similar to what they were in previous years, you know, um, Hispanic students continue to be significantly higher represented as Texas grant recipients than in the overall population. Um, I think it's what it was almost 20 percentage points higher. So they, they're 37.5 percent of all Texas students enrolled, um, but 56.5 percent of all Texas grant recipients were Hispanic students. Um, but that is consistent with what it's been for many years now. Um, so there wasn't anything that we saw um, that was significantly different. Um, the other piece that we did highlight uh, is that the graduation rates, um, if you look on page 22 um, of the report, um, one of the pieces that we looked at, oh, nope, sorry, that's not the right page. Uh, 21? No. Mm. Six-year? You balance? know what? I think it's just in the um, executive summary oh, the at the executive beginning. Okay. Um, but the four-year graduation for students who qualify for grants under the priority model um, is 14.1 percentage points higher um, than for students that are entering through other okay. pathways. Um, and so the priority model definitely is identifying, uh, you know, the goal of the priority model was to identify students that were demonstrating amongst different factors the most likely um, opportunity for success in college, um, and that definitely seems to be the case. Um, the students that are admitted through that, pro, you know, through the priority model are graduating at higher rates um, than other students. Thank you, appreciate that. 
Any other questions, concerns, comments? Okay, Deshay. Good afternoon, or is it still morning? Good morning. Uh, sorry, my voice is a little raspy. I've been under the weather a little bit. Um, so I think this agenda item is geared toward the data collection subcommittee, um, which is chaired by Samantha. And so I'll let her kind of start on what we've done from the last meeting. And then also we want to give an update to one of the projects that we brought to the advisory committee, which was that auto grant payment project that now has the funds request form uh, moved online along with the return of funds form for the three grant programs online. So we'll be looking at a little demonstration shortly. Great. Yes, we, uh, the subcommittee did meet um, a few weeks after our last meeting in March, on March 27th, um, and we had a healthy discussion about uh, the uh, summer, the guidance for some of the grant programs, uh, which the coordinating board has now moved forward with. We discussed this auto grant uh, project was coming up and that um, hoping that we would be able to, to see it the next time we meet, which actually turns out to be next week. The uh, committee is getting together on June 12th um, and we get to demo or practice with the uh, auto grant. So this is, I guess I get a preview. <laughs> <laughs> but we're actually going to get, uh, the committee will get their hands on it next week and be able to um, see how it works for us. Uh, I don't know if that brings us up to date. We're, the, the FAD's reporting, um, we've reviewed the manual for the um, next year, I guess 1920. Um, so we're still watching that um, and making any recommendations based on the current 1819. Uh, we're just starting our second cycle in a cup next week. I guess mm -hmm. next week we'll open up the the second cycle. So that's where we stand. Do you want to? I concur. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss something? No. Thank you, uh, Samantha. <clears throat> so as Samantha stated in the last. Uh, advisory subcommittee meeting that we had. We talked about the auto grant payment project. We even made a, a uh, announcement several months back about the changes that were going to occur regarding the return the return of funds form for the grant programs, which is the Texas grant TEOG and TEG, as well as how to request funds. So today we want to give you a preview of what it looks like for the institution side when they're going to request funds or return funds from any one of those three grant programs. Right now, the way it is set up is in CB Pass, which um, hopefully most of you all are familiar with and have credentials to, that is where we house the current form for the funds request. A person from the institution who has credentials and is approved, they will log into the CB Pass account and they would go to the application that they are approved for for one of those three grant programs. And once they will click onto that grant program, we're going to use Texas Grant as our demonstration, they would come to this particular page. This page here is giving you a summary which in the past you haven't had the opportunity to kind of follow your total allocations when you request any money. So here is a summary that allows anyone to come in to see what the total allocation that they've been approved for, what's available to them after they have submitted a request. So you'll see at the top where it says allocation summary, total allocation, available allocation, and then it'll also give you a running total of that student count that you would be providing on the request funds. Below you will see a another section called payment and return. This will allow anyone to view what payments are still needing to be approved. So once in the person will come submit a request funds, which we'll show you shortly, you'll be able to see that it's pending review for the coordinating board to approve so your funds can be sent to the institution. You will also be able to see what funds have been dispersed to the institution. So as questions do come to our area on when and where can I receive those funds, you'll actually be able to see this here. You'll be able to run a query that will then tell you any dispersed funds and the date, which we'll show you shortly as well. You'll also be able to see refunds. Um, so this is tied to the form, the return of funds, uh, excuse me, the funds request, fund return of funds form, and it's pending review. Pending review means that a form has been submitted, uh, but it may not 
be that the courting board has received the funds yet. So when you see that column that says received, then lets you know that we've actually received the funds that you have submitted for your return. So next I wanna show you how you would actually request funds. So you would click on the link that says request funds. And as we mentioned before, we're trying to make it very simple. So the only items that would be required for someone to complete would be the request amount and the new student count. As you will see, the appropriation year is tied to the year in which your funds were allocated and the program type that you have approval to actually submit funds for. Again, if you have approval for Texas grant, these are already pre-populated and so are the appropriation year. You would only need to plug in a request amount. So for a demonstration, we'll use $10,000. And we'll say we're gonna fund two students because we're gonna keep them at the target amount. Um, you go hit submit request. And when you hit submit request, as you can tell, it tells you that your payment was submitted successfully. But if you notice under available allocation, it took into account what you've already submitted um, pending review. So it has changed. Before it was $69,002 and now it's $59,002. Um, you have the ability to go back home. So if we click on the button to go back home, you will then see on the allocation summary I'm talking faster than my mouse is moving. Maybe. So on the allocation summary here, you will see again that the available allocation is a $59,002, and you'll see that the total count has increased by two, so now it's four. You'll also see under pending review, for the payment, so beforehand there was $1,000, if you remember, and now it's 11000 because it's accounting for the funds that we have requested. Now, in the event that we need to return any money um, in this same appropriation year, you'll go to return funds, and it will tell you that, again, the year is always going to follow you from page to page. And so right now for the demonstration, we'll have appropriation year 2019 as well as 2020, and we'll show you that it will follow you from year to year. So it keeps you very consistent in knowing what year you're actually making any actions for. So we want to return money, and we're going to say we're going to return $5,000 because, unfortunately, one of those students become became ineligible. So we're going to return $5,000. And here for the student count, what's important about this this is that when you're wanting to return money, you'll have to use any negative value or you'll have to say uh, zero, meaning you might have, uh, for some reason, returned money or a partial amount of money and the student still kept a portion of their money. So it doesn't really change your student count, but it may change your dollar amount for the student. So it allows you to put zero or a negative number. In this case, we're gonna say that we are actually returning it for one student so it can change our student count. So we would say negative one. You are required to put some type of comment in, so we'll just say not, you know, not eligible. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll hit submit return. Again, you'll see it's successful. As you notice here, it will say pending return 6,000. One of the things to keep in mind that total allocation only changes when we've actually received the money. And so once we got the money back from the institution based upon this, then the total allocation will change. Um, so for the purpose of the demonstration, you won't see any changes to the total allocation because that's on the administration side um, that will actually increase that allocation. So if we return back to home, <coughs> you'll see under refunds pending review is 6,000. So it had increased to show that we're still waiting at this point for $6,000 to be returned back from the institution. Now, uh, one of a very uh, neat feature that we thought is really valuable is if you go to transaction details, transaction details allows you to query for any status that you wanna see uh, regarding a return or a requested amount. So we're gonna change the program year to 2019 just so we can see uh, anything that's happened within 2019. The program type will always stay defaulted based upon what you're approved for your credentials. And in this particular case, we're gonna just hit run for all so we can see the statuses of everything that we've done. As you can uh, tell here, there is a 
two returns that have been listed and they both say CB waiting for funds, which means that the courting board is still waiting for funds from THCB University. They still need to return as funds. And we also see two requests which means that the institution has requested a dollar amount for 10,000 and a uh, dollar amount for 1,000. So this gives you the ability to actually query anything that you're looking for. Um, if we scroll back up to show you where the statuses are, you'll see under the statuses where the arrow is, this is all, so you can see all transactions, or if you wanna filter to determine you only wanna see something in particular, then you have the ability to see something in particular like waiting for approval. So waiting for approval, will basically mean that you're, you're waiting to see how that transaction for requested funds moves through the system. Uh, so once we receive the request of funds, we'll go ahead and do our workflow, which is for our approval purposes, and you'll be able to kind of track and see what waiting for approval looks like. Dispersed, again, is going to show you how, uh, when we actually disperse funds to your institution. So that's based upon um, us receiving a file back from USAS and it will actually give the actual date that the fund should have hit your account at your institution. Um, for any reason, if something gets canceled, meaning that you made an error when you did submit uh, a request funds or funds form, uh, return of funds form, we'll be able to, on our side of the house, cancel it so you'll see that action in case you wanna track anything. So as you can tell, this particular um, application gives you a lot more functionality than the one prior where you're only just submitting a request and really didn't know what was going on with the actual payment. And here you have the uh, flexibility of looking at everything yourself and hopefully it'll be able to answer some questions that you may have or whoever your reporting official is that may have without having to necessarily contact the coordinating board or um, having to send a contact us request. You have uh, everything pretty much in your hands um, and you can look at it anytime, especially when you get questions um, from students or administration that wants to know a little bit more what's going on with any payments. So I'll open up for any questions, um, but we're really excited for what this functionality allows administrators to do. We think it's a lot more simpler, um, and it should definitely um, give you a lot more information than you've had in the past. Uh, Deshay, great work. I'm probably the poster child of having to re revise my uh, request form, and I'd really appreciate the detail and really appreciate you guys. Thank so you. Kudos to you and the committee. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Anything else? When is it going to go live? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so deep in the project. Um, go live is August 1st. So when you receive your final allocations, it will say that you have the ability to start requesting your funds for 1920 beginning August 1st. Um, so you'll be able to actually use this um, system and request your funds. As you know, we don't disperse any funds until after September 1st, after the start of the fiscal year. But at least you'll be able to put in your request a lot quicker and hopefully a lot faster than before um, because again, it's two fields, so that's a good thing. Um, and you don't have to do four fields, um, so hopefully the two fields has changed the way that you'll process um, and sending those requests to us. I just wanted to thank all of you for all of the feedback on the different ideas that we've had um, as we've put this together, um, and I, I really want to commend Deshay on having navigated this project um, and for having navigated me through this project, because there's times where this would have been way bigger if you would let me just run with it, and she was really good about kind of helping me understand what was really needed, et cetera, and I think that um, she's been able to guide us towards something that everybody benefits. We're going to benefit immensely on our side, um, and I hope that institutions will benefit immensely on theirs as well. So thank you to Shay, to all of the data collection subcommittee who helped um, provide feedback, as well as to all of the ISS staff um, and FAS staff um, who helped with this. Okay. Thank you, Samantha and Deshay. Much appreciated. Thank you. 
Before we move on to the next item, I did want to remind everyone, um, I don't want to be remiss in this, at the end of your packet is the form. Please do fill it out and hand it in before you leave today. Okay, task for subcommittee, Robert. Uh, yes, so uh, the subcommittee met twice since the last uh, Financial Aid Advisory Committee, uh, once March 27th and May 7th. Um, the committee, uh, during that time, the committee conducted an informal email poll of uh, primary institution contacts. Uh, the response rate uh, was inconsistent, so it was decided that to use a uh, electronic survey method. Uh, so we ended up using uh, Qualtrics. Um, and, uh, and it was distributed through the task for listserv. So, uh, the Lisa, thank you for allowing us to use the software and distribute the distribution. Um, we receive a total of 47 respondents that answer at least one question on the survey. Um, based on those uh, results and the discussions by the uh, subcommittee, uh, I want to propose four recommendations and would like to request your feedback. First uh, recommendation is to incorporate the selected service statement within the application. Survey data show that 87% of the respondents believe that incorporating the selected service statement within the application itself will reduce administrative burden on schools. The second recommendation is to remove the not register option uh, to the selected service statement. Uh, we believe that by only presented eligible responses, uh, clearly stating proof of registration is required, it would uh, reduce the likelihood that a student will have to make a correction to an already submitted application. The third recommendation is to remove the question that asks uh, non-tax filers to explain how they financially support themselves. This is question 79, uh, ask students to explain what sources of income or public assistance uh, they have to use to pay for living expenses. Uh, since uh, Dear Colleague Letter Jan 1607 uh, removed this requirement from the verification groups, the committee believes that uh, this is essentially not necessary. Uh, and the fourth recommendation is to add uh, money, money received or paid on your behalf under uh, student untaxed income. Uh, this is just to align it uh, the same as the FAFSA. Uh, there were other observations from the data. Uh, one was that uh, the survey uh, shows the general support for the creation of an online task file, which it will be accomplished by HB uh, 2140. Uh, and then also the survey results uh, show that uh, um, the opening of the task file of October 1st is uh, accepted by a large majority of the schools, but they would like to have the application a month earlier uh, to allow those who have contracted out the third party for el electronic task file to modify their, uh, their own application uh, before October 1st. Uh, this will be necessary again until HB 2140 uh, takes effect. Uh, and that's it, and I would like some feedback if you don't mind. Oh, the number four is to add money received on your behalf. Yeah, kind of like the TASFA has. I mean, FASFA. I'm going to jump in on the selective service right away. Yeah. <laughs> please, 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 whatever we can do to change that. <laughs> that That is just an unbelievable burden right now. We have um, a large number of students where this is a significant barrier and is causing us a lot of work in gathering that information. Yeah, I think that I talked to Chad a little bit about that because we've been talking about, you know, this at, back at work about the selective service and really, you know, what the FAFSA says, you know, you, you know, if it, most male students must register with the system and if you are a male 1820 not 18 to 25 not registered, then, you know, the FAFSA will basically register you, um, but there's not that option to say I'm not registered. So. And currently, you know, in what Diane kind of feeding on that, what we were, you know, what we're doing with the students and kind of what we're having to go back and do um, in order to get the statement and everything um, for the students. Some, the students are a little bit confused, but they can be confused on many things. Um, so, you know, we were just wondering that for current, I don't know what other schools are doing right now, but for this current year, um, has everybody been getting the statement along with selective service registration on male students? That, that's how we've been doing it. For all state mm -hmm. programs. Correct. Correct. 
even if um, even for your waivers and exemption is that correct actually the waiver and exemption is one of the biggest problems. right I'm sorry the waivers and the exemption is one of the biggest problems for us because a lot of those students are not filing the FAFSA correct. and so we have to go out and gather that information I'll just add that I like the idea of not having a not registered option. That's the confusion we're having at our institution is if they're not registered and they're not going to register and they're never going to register, then we don't really care because they're not going to get aid. Mm -hmm. So we're only dealing with students who have registered or are attempting to register, which again is another whole issue, and students that have either for various reasons not registered or weren't required at the time dealing with those two we're, we're not dealing at all with someone who's not registered and then when the student marks that now we have to go back and figure out what they really should have marked do you mind if i hop in too i just wanted to point out that um next week's data sub collection committee one of the agenda items is to review selective service with that group um, and the reason is during the task for subcommittee we identified the challenges with the current layout of the form and um, we talked about the different ways that it's being collected the different boxes um, the fact that some of the schools have modified it to fit their uh, business practice at their school so we want to roll that out that benefit to all the schools and this is a great opportunity so that we can change it for next year but since TASF was released so early we want to do that now so um, my team's going to start developing this upcoming the 2021 TASFA this summer so if we can change the selective service for next year's guidelines and you know the, the following year then we want to do that now so that is going to be a discussion item next week so that we can collectively come together and say what makes the most sense for all the majority of the schools and then um, where to place it within the TASPA is it going to be with the question that asks if they're male um, we had a uh, recommendation that that seems the most logical spot would it be at the end there's a lot of intricacies on it because again confusing a student who may have already submitted their stuff to you making sure that they understand that they don't have to continually submit the same documentation how do you deal with the timing of someone who's in the process of registering so we're trying to create a statement that addresses all of those issues i don't know that we'll ever have it perfect but i think that um, one adding it to the form is going to be a huge help and then two expanding the form so that the student can understand what they need to do and that the school knows what kind of status they fall in will be a lot help more helpful so uh, more to come so okay. any other comments Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Wait, uh, Diane, I do have a question. So what are the next steps with the recommendations? So, uh, Leah, oh, I, oh, I don't know. That's fine. <laughs> I, I, oh, Chair, maybe this is a question for you. Uh, the subcommittee proposes this recommendations now. Is there, is, is it, uh, do we need to have it approved by the Financial Advisory Committee? We haven't historically done that, but this is the first time that we've had a subcommittee that's done this kind of analysis. Um, I mean, it's. I think we came to the committee just to say, here's what we're recommending as long as no one has any pushback or any concerns with the items we're recommending then we're going to move forward because in order to release it a month early to the schools not to the students we aren't planning to post this on um, college for all texans on our websites for the students until october 1st but we the hope is that we can get it out to the schools so that again vendors can update the any software and that schools who want to brand the TASFA or add it to their portals or do anything they have that opportunity to get it updated because it's my understanding that some people add a cover page they have a checklist they there's different things so we need to definitely have agreement that it's y'all are good with those decisions so we can move it forward so and I, I don't think we have to formally vote on it or anything it's more just a feedback piece so okay. and then uh, at our September um, advisory committee you know this is a standing item so you'll be able to let Give us know update. what it actually looks like and yeah show okay, it sounds to great us. perfect thank you Robert and Leah thank you much appreciated. Okay, next item I, discussion on proposed updates to Texas Administrative Code. Chad? 
Thank you. Um, I mentioned at a, a previous um, committee meeting that one of the things that I'm working to do is to more actively engage the Financial Aid Advisory Committee on um, proposed rule changes prior to those going out um, for comment. Um, so that we can kind of, if there's feedback already that you have, um, that we can make alterations or understand implications, um, we can include that prior to even going out for the 30-day um, comment. Um, I think it also provides an opportunity to just more actively engage in discussion about it um, as opposed to solely relying on the 30-day comment. Um, so these are just, I, I tried to provide information on why all these changes were happening. Um, it's much more detailed than goes out in a 30-day comment period, Texas Register notification. Um, but I figured the more detail, the better um, to help you. Um, and based on this, there's really kind of two pieces that I'm hoping to get from today's discussion. One is specific to, you know, are there any changes in TEG or the general provision section um, that you have any concerns about or that you think we should go back and look at? Um, and secondly, because it's the first time I've done it this way, um, was the information that I provided helpful in understanding the changes that we're proposing and is there anything that I could do to modify how I provide you this information um, to improve discussions in the future? So those are the, the two pieces. Um, why don't we start with um, the um, information itself. Let's actually jump to the general provisions. Um, so that's after page one of five, agenda item I, page one of five. Um, it says chapter 22 at the top of it, subchapter A, general provisions. Um, in reading through this, did you all have any feedback that you think is important for me to take um, and keep in mind um, before um, putting these out for comments? Um, when you talking about attempted hours, are dual credit considered in this at all? Any dual credit courses? I'm, I'm just reading it real quick. Every course, and every system. with online to repeat courses. Yes, for the purpose of attempted sem semester credit hours, I don't believe there's anything in statute that excludes dual credit from attempted credit hours. That would, and the reason I'm asking that somewhat is because here, in, in, in with Texas Grant, it talks about dual credit in the pathway, but it doesn't speak to dual credit, I think, in attempted hours. Yeah, in Texas Grant, it speaks to dual credit from uh, the concept of an entering student, oh, that an for. entering student um, is, uh, dual credit is not considered in deciding if someone's an entering student. Um, so, but the, a transfer wouldn't be through the entering student pathway. Okay. And so dual credit would be part of that, but the reason it's in the entering student is because to be an entering student, you are limited to having 30 semester credit hours already completed, mm -hmm. um, whereas the other pathways don't have a cap on how many semester hours you can have completed to be considered through the TEOG pathway, the associate pathway, or the military pathway. So if a, if a transfer student did in turn have some dual credit hours, then we would need to count those hours? Towards the overall attempted semester credit hours, yes. Because even with your entering students, their dual credit is counted towards their attempted semester credit hours. It's just not counted in determining if they're an entering student. Okay. It's my understanding, and always has been, um, dual credit really doesn't count 
um, until they are graduating high school, and then it all kind of catches up with them. Um, even if they're a transfer student, it still counts. But up until graduation from high school, they're exempt from a lot of things, including the six drop rule. And I'll admit that I don't know the academic side of dual credit. I am not an expert on things like the six drop rule and things like that. So. Can I ask if there are other schools that have implemented grade exclusion policies? We are not using it to calculate financial aid, but our institution, at the behest of our Student Government Association, um, is now allowing a grade exclusion where during their freshman year, students are allowed to read, if, if they don't successfully complete a course in their freshman year or they're not satisfied with the grade they received in the course their freshman year, they can subsequently um, retake the course and petition to have that grade excluded. And of course, we had to go through great clarification and FAQs to ensure that everyone understands it's not impacting your financial aid. We're using all the grades and we're not going to make something disappear from your transcript. It actually still appears on the transcript, but it's not being counted in grade point calculation. I just wondered if other schools were experiencing the grade exclusion phenomenon. We had that for quite some time under one of our presidents, um, and then it went away. So <laughs> when he left, he went, he left, and, and then boom, it was gone. But um, we did have policies in place at that point, and we were very specific in all the financial aid information that we sent out and in communication communications with the university as a whole that it is not excluded for financial aid purposes. And it was in our policies that all attempted hours were accounted. For. And we do have, we do have that <coughs> policy as well. So we have the re ability to repeat and replace a grade. It counts in attempted hours. It is excluded from the GPA. We had the same thing as San Jack. A uh, student can repeat the course and it is automatically uh, replaced with the highest grade. Any other comments about what we're proposing to um, post for a 30-day comment period in terms of the adjustments to the general provisions? A lot of it is just moved out of the individual aid programs and into the general provisions, so they're not new pieces. Um, I did reword some things just to make them make more sense. One particular question I did want to ask of you all is, um, in reading through all of this, I notice that we use both the terms period of enrollment and academic year. And one of the things that I also noticed is that our concept of, the state's concept of period of enrollment in these rules is different than the period of enrollment term that's used for federal purposes. Um, and so I was, debating whether or not um, since we have an academic year, which is the 12-month period des designated by an eligible institution as its financial aid award year, um, which is, I think, aligns um, with the feds, but then our period of enrollment is the semester or semesters within the current state fiscal year, September 1 to August 31st, for which the student was enrolled in an improved institution and met all the eligibility requirements for an award through this program. So our period of enrollment is looking at kind of a whole fiscal year, whereas the federal period of enrollment is the semester that you're awarding aid for. Um, I haven't been able to find anything so far that really requires period of enrollment to be defined. It seems like academic year would work for all of our programs, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, do you all rely on the difference between our definition of academic year and our definition of period of enrollment for something that you're doing on your campuses? Did anyone even realize that we had these two different definitions? <laughs> and be fi fine to say no if you didn't. 
we might just read them and we kind of like, okay, yeah, period enrollment is the academic year, you mm -hmm. know, kind of interchangeably, in, yeah. if you will. Like, we're like, okay, yeah, we now understand what they're saying, mm -hmm. even though they're, because we do that sometimes in our own publications, <laughs> and we're like, okay, we need to do this right, but, um, no. But I think that's true for most of us that have traditional mm -hmm. uh, academic, but there, but there are, don't. could be schools that cut in the middle and it doesn't align with the fiscal year, their academic year might not allow. Well, and that's one of the pieces as well now is that a lot of, there's the potential for even more to not have it align um, because of uh, our encouragement of summer awards. So now all the folks that are doing summer headers, um, you know, the fact is, regard like the federal government gives you the ability to kind of shift money around, and unfortunately, based on statutory rules about spending money, we can't do that. Um, you know, as I've mentioned when we talked about, if you're doing summer header and you want to award money during the summer header, we can't actually disperse that money to you until the fall. Um, you all can. You know, put it on there, use it as a deferment against their bill, things like that, but we can't actually send you the money um, until after September 1st. Um, and so I think summer is already blurring the lines anyway on period of enrollment. So, well, I'm going to dig deeper and try to see if I can find um, period of enrollment used somewhere in any of our rules where it really is a, hey, you know, this will cause a huge problem if we just start saying at the academic year instead of period enrollment. Um, secondly, and this is probably a more targeted question um, because I think we only have one person from a private institution with us today. Um, so, Paul, did you see anything in the TEG um, materials that caused you any concern? No, sir, it looks all good to me. Thank you very much. I've also sent it to ICUT so that they can um, take a look at it. I think I, I think sent it out. Oh. I think you did a lot of meticulous work on it. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. We are going to uh, get that. Um, it should go out by, uh, I think, in the next couple of weeks. We have to get it all formatted because my formatting isn't the right way. Wanda's going to curse me for having done it wrong. Um, so, but we, it, I think it's like by end of June, early July, we have to get it out in order for it to be uh, taken to the September CAPS meeting. Um, and so that's one of the things I'll also let you know is that there are a number of things that we are going to be putting out for comment um, in the, uh, towards the end of the month, the beginning of July, um, that I wasn't able to bring to this meeting because they were all reliant on statu um, statutory changes. And so now we're having to play catch up on, okay, these bills actually passed and we have to get something changed. Um, so do, for you know, whoever in your offices keeps an eye on um, those pieces, um, please be aware that there are other things that are gonna go for this um, summer um, so that we can have the board vote and approve those um, in September at the committee meeting and then October at the board meeting. Um, we have started to and we will continue our practice that when things are posted to the Texas Register, we drop an email to um, the TASFA listserv to let people know um, as well as to the larger um, listserv that's maintained internally um, of people at financial aid office. That's got several hundred people on it, thousands of people on it. Um, and so, you know, once it's on, um, posted in the Texas Register, we'll send a note out to both of those listservs to try to make sure that you're aware um, that these are out there for comment. So. Thank you. Before we move on to the next presentation, I just want to, um, I've kind of estimated our remaining time and hopefully we might be able to get through this in 40 minutes to an hour, but I wanted to give you all the opportunity. Do you want to just plow on forward? Okay, then we are going to plow on forward. <laughs> Terry?
Good afternoon. It's one minute afternoon. <laughs> um, this it, there's quite a few slides that are in the handout. This is really going to go pretty quick. Um, you may have some questions, but um, it should go fairly quickly because I know we are all hungry and want to get out of here really quick. Um, I am the coordinator, district coordinator of college and career readiness in Fort Bend ISD. Um, one thing that um, I discovered when I got to Fort Bend ISD was that they were using national student clearinghouse data and had been for about, well, now for about 11 years. When I was here in the Austin area, both in Round Rock ISD and Pflugerville ISD, um, and as far as I know, neither one of them used this data yet. Uh, you're all familiar with National Student Clearinghouse, I'm sure, because it was, it was developed in higher ed. Um, when I got to Fort Bend ISD and realized what a treasure this data was um, and its accuracy, I live in those reports that come out every three or four months. I mean, absolutely live in them. It's a report card on what, whether we're doing our job pushing kids hard enough up the chain for you guys in higher ed to pull them up. If we don't push them hard enough, they tend to fall off that summer right between um, high school and graduation. One reason or two reasons that I chose to talk about National Student Clearinghouse and Fort Bend ISD is Fort Bend ISD is the eighth largest school district in Texas. We're also one of the, the most culturally diverse districts in the nation. Um, and Fort Bend County, in particular, is one of the most diverse counties in the nation. We are a big school district with 80 schools, and we have a lot of innovative programs coming online. Um, we're also the largest employer in Fort Bend County. That says a lot when your school district is the largest employer, especially in an oil-rich area. Um, these are some statistics just basically on how diverse um, our school district is. We currently have 37 percent economically disadvantaged. One thing about our ECODIS population, we started free dual credit through Houston Community College three years ago. Uh, prior to that, it was for full tuition, uh, for out of service or in service. And our economically disadvantaged, all of our uh, statistics on dual credit went through the roof. I mean, we went up like 350 percent. Um, economically disadvantaged spiked way up, and it would because it doesn't, it didn't cost them anymore to take those courses. There can be this generalization or this perception out there about economically disadvantaged students that they may not be as academically prepared for college because they have a lack of resources or lack of access to resources. Our passing rate did not uh, get affected at all by this sharp increase in EcoDesk students. Uh, it remained right at about 94 percent passing rate, which is phenomenal, I think. A um, couple of things that we're doing, we don't do anything on a small scale uh, in Fort Bend. Oh, the second reason that I'm doing this is because I'm a little biased. I work for Fort Bend ISD and I know it a lot better than most districts around Texas. We are starting three um, early college high schools this fall, which is a huge undertaking. Uh, one of those is a traditional early college high school and two are P-TECH schools, which that's a whole new ball game. Um, I, I think P-TECH has been around for one year now. Um, we, we Why don't you go ahead and let us know what P-TECH is in case there's anyone oh, who doesn't know what it you're is. You're going to ask me what it stands for. Um, is the concept of what it is. P-TECH is, is basically we're going to have two different, two different P-TECH schools and it will be an associate's degree or um, a level two certificate and it focuses on a specific discipline such as computers. Uh, we're going to have one on computer track and another on a healthcare track. Traditional early college high school is an associate's of science or associate's of arts and usually a general degree plan. Um, we're also opening a wonderful CTE center that you probably have heard about, but you may not have heard about the CTE center. Um, during the uh, construction of the CTE center, we discovered 95 bodies. Um, this was, uh, yes, that's in our district. And uh, our CTE director 
it, there were lots of things floating around the district. You know, the place is going to be haunted with ghosts and all this stuff. Our CTE director is just a wonderful person. She, she has had a positive outlook this whole time. Um, and just till recently, the bodies were out there in a refrigerated trailer, you know, just waiting on what the decision was going to be. She says, we're not going to have ghosts. We have 95 angels watching over our CTE center. So the plan is still being decided by the state and also by the school district. But the current plan is that we're going to reinter those um, bodies where we found them. And we're going to create a memorial out there. And we just moved, we just moved uh, what was going to be built there to a different location. So we're a little bit behind on construction. A um, couple of things about the center. We responded to. Um, and what this has to do with financial aid and higher education, I see colleges starting to do this. We're responding to what ind industry is telling us they need. So when we were looking at our welding program, um, the oil companies and the other construction companies that we were partnering with told us we don't have welders welding in a booth. Because in, in high schools and in colleges, you have kids welding in a booth. The CTE center is in a U shape, and across the two arms of the U is a bridge. That bridge is going to be fashioned with harnesses, and our welders will be hanging from these harnesses, welding upside down, welding in real life situations. This bridge also, for a firefighting program, you can back up a fire truck with the ladder and do rescues off this bridge. So we're responding to what the industry is telling us, this is what we need. You can't train these, you know, these kids, you can't train these people in a box, you know, or in a classroom. It has to be real world. One last thing and then I'll move on. Um, we also have a law enforcement program. It has a big room with a 360 degree screen. This screen is interactive. You have pistols and tasers that are not real, but they interact with the screen. And there's about three or four hundred different programs that you can go through. Law enforcement has already said we want to use this facility. Anyway, they go, they go in, and these are our high school kids. Um, and they're going to be reaching your institutions to finish out a bachelor's degree, go into you know, law enforcement, whatever. But they're in this room, 360 degrees, by themselves or with others, and there's these scenarios playing out in real life. And if there's an active shooter coming around, they have to take that shooter out. Blood splatters all over the screen. It's real life. Now, parents are going to say, you're, you're having this kind of a program with high school students? They're going into law enforcement. They need to know what they're getting into. So, and then we got culinary arts and cosmetology, and, you know, our um, teachers can use the child care there for th for if they have three- and four-year-old children. One-way windows, you know, to look through on all these different programs. Um, We'll have a restaurant. I mean, it's have, we're partnering with businesses all around the community to do a lot of different things. So other than the 95 souls that we have on site, you're going to hear a lot about this center. It's, it's very cutting edge. And we spent a lot of money on it. It's about the size of three Walmarts. Um, National Student Clearinghouse, thank you guys for founding this back when it got started in 1993. Um, currently, there's 3,600 um, colleges nationwide that participate in National Student Clearinghouse. There are a few that are not included in this. It includes about 94 percent of all higher education institutions. Some private proprietary are not included in there, and some trade schools, which I don't like the term trade schools, but I would say tech schools, um, are not included in there either. Um, but um, institutions such as DeVry are included, and that's a private proprietary that does four-year degrees. Um, this is one of the things that kind of bothers me is there's only 12,200 participating high schools nationwide. That's nationwide. There are a hundr hundreds of thousands of high schools nationwide. Very few high schools are actually using this data. And they really should use this data. And I'm not sure what a higher education report looks like with, from National Student Clearinghouse. It's probably very different than what we see. What we see is what our kids do right after high school, one year out from high school, and two years out from high school. And I'll show you a slide 
from class of 2011 what they're doing and what they've been doing over the past seven or eight years, which may surprise you. You know, we expect everybody to graduate in six years. Some are taking eight and nine years to get through. That has an impact on financial aid, too. Um, this is what our reports look like when we get them. And I'm not going to go over every one of these slides, but I'm just going to point them out. <clears throat> we put a lot of emphasis, um, especially with financial aid, too, on students that immediately pursue college right after high school. Okay? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, in a little bit about gappers, uh, gap students, because there are a significant percentage of those that will lay out for a year to two years, and sometimes longer. Currently in our school district, and yes, we are going down a little bit, these graphs are very easy to read, but currently we're hovering right at about 70% of our high school graduates going directly to college immediately following high school graduation. And that includes the summer right after high school, but it's primarily the fall. Um, these statistics that we get go up slightly, about 1%. At the most I've ever seen it is 2% once it gets to the end of the school year because of late reporters from institutions. And again, this is nationwide. Um, public and private, obviously we have the majority of our students going to public institutions, but we do have some going to private, especially when they can secure good scholarships in those private institutions. They may make the choice to go there. It may cost less for them to go to that private institution than to pay outright to go to a public. Just depends on the institution. Four year and two year. Um, you may notice at 2014, there's kind of a, a weird bump. There's an increase in four year and a decrease in two year. That was when National Student Clearinghouse actually reclassified uh, many two year schools across the nation because they were now offering bachelor's degrees. So they reclassified them into four year institutions. And in-state and out-of-state, I'll talk about this at the end. Most of our kids in Fort Bend County um, or Fort Bend ISD will stay close to home, the majority of them. And I found that to be true here in the Austin area as well. Now, close to home here could be San Marcos or UTSA. I mean, we've got a lot of great universities just within about 100, 150 miles from here. Now, kids that wait... Um, a year to attend school, the gappers, it goes up a little bit, goes up about 3% um, of those that will wait, that will uh, stay out of school that first year and then attend the next year. I remember when I was working over here at Hendrickson High School in Pflugerville, we had a, a high percentage of Mormon students. And if you're a male and a Mormon, you're required to do um, a, a service project or mission work that first year out of high school. So I had to work with uh, individual scholarship foundations to hold that money. You know, they want it to be used immediately after high school, but when you have somebody that's doing a mission trip, they were usually willing to work with that student to hang on to that money till they got back. It was a good bet that they were come back, going to come back and go to college, so they held on to it. But not not Notice that we're right at about 73% with the kids that wait a year. And same thing with the various public, private, in-state, out-of-state, two-year, four-year. And then you go to two years out. And ignore that last little dip. That's because we don't have the full percentages on that class yet, 2018. But we're right at about, I think it's 78%. So from 70% two years out, it's going up 8%. And I'll show you what that means in real numbers to a class of 6,000. Um, it's quite a few. Where that's important for higher ed to understand is not only from a financial aid standpoint, there's kids still out there that are making decisions of where they're wanting to go. It's in a bad place. Um, again, follows the same pattern as first year and immediately after. This is very encouraging for us. Now, this is just Fort Bend, but remember how diverse we are? Remember how diverse we are? Look at our retention rate. Um, percent of 
students enrolled in college first year after high school who return to a second year. And we all know if they return a second year, there's a good chance they're going to be back a third and fourth. Some will drop out after that, but that it's making it through that freshman year and coming back. And actually, that first semester can be really tough. Um, I've seen that with some of the real large schools that it's hard to get them back that second semester. Things happen. I saw that when I lived here in Austin for over 30 years. I saw that with UT with a lot of kids. They, they really struggled that first year, mainly because it was, um, well, there were things they got into that they probably shouldn't have. And mom and dad weren't around to say, you can't do that. It's like, I'm free. I can do what I want. Um, percent of uh, percent of percent, that's a typo. High school class have completed a degree within six years. Since we are still pretty early uh, since 2011, notice that we have about 50% that have completed a degree within six years. I'm going to show you a slide here that shows a little bit different. This is slide 29. Every year that we've gotten these reports for the six years I've been in Fort Bend, it's always slide 29. And this is the one I almost go to. I go to the slide number two, see where we are, you know, with immediately following high school. Now I go to slide 29. Now I hope you can see the colors on this. The blue at the top on the class of 2011, those were ones that were not trackable during that year through National Student Clearinghouse. These are military, workforce, missing in action. And they just were not trackable in any type of post-secondary institution. The green is new to college. And notice that there is a continuing green. It may be a small percentage, but there's students that are entering for the first time throughout that uh, seven-year history. The purple at the bottom are graduates. Okay, that's, those are the ones that are graduating. Notice that seven years out, we've still got kids that are graduating. That has an impact on financial aid as well, the longer they stay in school. I um, saw a presentation from uh, a lady I used to work with at University of Texas. This was in Houston at an HCC um, data summit. And what we originally thought about dual credit, saving money, and you know, giving kids 12, 15, you know, 21 college credit hours so they could actually go and graduate a year early. What we assumed was going to happen with that has not exactly turned out to be true. Kids are getting to college, they're taking their time getting through. They're taking courses knowing that they've got a, a cushion, a buffer. They're taking courses that they really don't need. Impacts financial aid. So is it causing kids to graduate earlier, some, but not on the scale that we thought it would. Same, same goes for AP as well. And we know that dual credit and AP takes away from higher ed, but when they have those courses under their belt, they are so much more likely to not only pursue college, but also finish a degree. So it may take money out of higher ed's pocket, but it also ensures that those kids are going to be successful. Helps them through. Um, back on the graph, the uh, orange is persisted, and notice that the kids that persist are kind of in relation to um, the ones that graduate. The blue, the light blue, those were the gappers or ones that stopped after they went to college and then they went back. Okay. National Student Clearinghouse is like having a little spy on every graduate's shoulder, you know, devil or angel, however you want to look at, but a little spy. And it watches them all the way through until they graduate from college. We can go into the raw data files, which are highly confidential. We can't release those to anyone. But we look at those raw data files because we provide them. And then National Student Clearinghouse runs the stats on them. We can find a specific student and see their whole history where they may have taken a stop out, where they transferred to another institution, whether they dropped out, and it actually has what degree they got and the discipline when they finish. And I've had some of the high schools that will go back several years and find a graduate out of, you know, 900,000 lines of data 
because uh, it's been going so long, and they'll actually look at the history of that student and find out, hey, they graduated, and we didn't think this kid would even make it the first year. So it's really, it's really kind of neat to, to watch it. Anyway, um, this is one of my favorite slides, obviously, because we can tell how hard we've pushed them into higher ed and how much higher ed has pulled them up. You know, again, we've got to push them hard enough to where they make it to you guys so you can pull them up. <clears throat> also, it gives us our top 25 institutions. If your institution is not on here, I'm sorry, it's the Houston area. No surprise that Houston Community College and Wharton County Junior College, uh, Wharton County covers seven of our high schools. Um, we're out of their service area, well, we're out of their taxing district, but in their service area. We have four, four high schools that are in um, HCC service area. That has caused a lot of problems with Fort Penn ISD being split between two community colleges. But those are the two that are at the top, and of course, University of Houston right down the street, because our kids tend to stay close, is number three. Uh, UT Austin with top 7% is number four. That is primarily because of one high school that we have, uh, which is referred to as Har Harvard on the Brazos. Um, 50% of the kids in that school have the same GPA as the top 5 or 10% in any other high school. So top 7% doesn't work for that one. We have two other very high performing schools. And then we have Title I schools, and it's very diverse. Uh, current trends, I already talked about holding at 70% direct to college, which is about 4,200 headed to college. You can do the numbers in your head on what that could mean to your institution if better um, recruiting efforts, <laughs> we're done. 3% are first year gappers, that's 180 students that are out there just kind of floating around that first year, but they're gonna go at some point, they're gonna go. 8% uh, drives it up to about 480 students on average. So even though they've graduated high school, recruiting is not over. And we keep in, in touch with a lot of those students. We use Navience in our district, and Navience is a wonderful tool for communication. First thing they do when they're middle schoolers is change the email address that self-populates to the district email they have. They put their personal email in there, which we would encourage them not to use Pokemon char characters or anything like that. Have a professional email address for college. First name dot last name at Gmail. Can't go wrong. And we can send them mass emails by grade level, by GPA level, for scholarship purposes, just to economically disadvantaged, just to avid students, and we can create our own groups. Counselors can create their own groups with their alpha. Um, our CCR advisors, which is another thing that we have that not all school districts have now, more and more you're seeing those. Um, they, can, they can sort whatever emails to the students and their parents and it's a great communication tool. There's no reason that you know parents and students aren't informed unless they just don't check email. That's another challenge with millennials. But they can forward that to their phone, and oftentimes that's what they do. Um, our students tend to stay within about 150 miles from home. There's an exception to that, and it's Texas Tech. Um, I, yeah, go Red Raiders. Um, <laughs> We have quite a few that go to Texas Tech, and I'm, I'm, I don't know this, but it's just an assumption it's got to do with the medical school. Um, and it has a lot to do with Lubbock, which is eight hours past almost nowhere, but it's, it's a wonderful school. I've toured, and it's, it's an awesome school. Um, military enlistments that we have count for about 1%. It depends on the school and the culture of the school. Uh, but we'll have about 1% to 2%, sometimes, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, focus on careers and college readiness. I'd, I've gotten calls from parents that have said, yeah, we, want, we really want to look into what are the best high schools to attend, you know, where do, you, where do these kids go to college, you know, are they Ivy League, so forth. Mm -hmm. And then I'll realize, well, where does your son or daughter go to? And it's like, oh, well, they're just four years old right now. We're just looking into what will be the best location for them. 
And I'm thinking, okay, we're struggling just to get this senior class out the door, and she's got a four-year-old and wants to know, where's the best high school to send them? And all of our high schools are awesome. Some are better than others at certain things. But, you know, I would never say, oh, take your kid here instead of over here. Because they, they all have a different personality. But talking about careers in elementary is, is not off target. It's, it's awful early to talk about college, but kids see their mom and dad or, you know, or whatever going to work every day. They're curious. They want to know, what do you do? What do you do for a living? What do other people do for a living? Especially elementary, because it's always, you know, why, 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 who? Uh, middle school, they start really looking at what they want to do. One thing that we do at every middle school we have is a career day, and we bring in higher institutions. Uh, institutions of higher, higher education, businesses, employers, different disciplines, doctors, you know, ophthalmologists, and, and runs the gamut at every one of our 15 high schools. Kids dress up, these are eighth graders, the kids dress up in coat and tie and I always walk around and kind of tug on the tie a little bit, see if it's a clip on or if they actually tied it. And if it's tied, I ask them, did your dad do that? Yes. Some actually have learned to tie a tie. It's impressive. Um, AP and dual credit, I've already mentioned that. We really push dual credit and AP a lot in our school district. Um, we have made great strides to get rid of the gatekeepers for AP. If you're familiar with uh, P-12 education at all, you know that there has been a tendency in the past to only, you know, AP is open to any student. However, we want the brightest, you know, in these classes. It's open to everybody in, in Fort Bend, and we really encourage kids to, to attempt it. And if they can't do it, we'll let them get back into regular classes. But we really focus on every student being able to take it. Um, extracurricular and community service, grades are not 100% determinant that someone's going to be successful in college. Um, I've seen top 10 percenters and top 7 percenters. They didn't make it. Um, I think what is better, a better determinant, is extracurricular community service. Worked with a student, this was 10 years ago, at Hendrickson. She barely graduated high school, but she was the queen of community service. And when she got to college, she did okay, but she now owns her own business. It's a kind of a hospitality event planning business, and she's doing great. I would have put more on her than somebody that maybe had a straight A GPA, all AP, and no extracurricular and no community service. Um, and you guys know that. The, the, the fully, you know, well-rounded student is the best um, or most successful. Financial aid planning early, really early. Now, talking about the FAFSA in middle school, not necessarily, but talking about what college is going to cost, and I, like I said earlier, I direct um, almost every student I deal with to College for All Texans because that's an accurate portrayal in Texas of what it's going to cost. Sticker price, not what they may actually pay. Um, one thing, and I'd, I heard uh, Charles bring this up, and it's like he stole my line. One thing we do with HARN, the Houston Area uh, Recruiters Network, is they work very hard and work with us to provide financial aid education workshops. We have a presence of college reps on all of our campuses frequently, frequently. Each fall and each spring, they do um, college fairs during our lunches. This is just one thing they do um, at all 12 high schools, or all 11 traditional high schools, and then we have one special high school. And they'll have 30 or 35 reps at each one of these. In the fall, it's for seniors. In the spring, it's for juniors. That's just one thing we do. College application boot camps, which we're doing July 18th and 19th, or 17th and 18th. We do one north and one south because the district is so big. It's 30 miles by 15 miles wide. Um, it's huge. And we will have roughly about 250 kids show up at each one um, out of 6,000, so you know, about a twelfth of the senior class. That is all run by HARN, and we will do financial aid presentations, uh, essay writing, a number of different things, and then they'll actually meet with the reps 
and then they'll bring their laptops or go to computer labs and they'll start their applications July 18th and 19th. Now a lot will become page niners if you're familiar with App, uh, Apply Texas. What is page nine? It's the essay. They'll start off July 18th, they'll get everything done except the essay, and then they'll turn it into the university the day before the deadline with an essay. They wait until the last minute. Um, but we work very closely with all the institutions that are around us. Um, Texas State Technical College actually underwrites some of our uh, dual credit courses at the new CTE Center and has already been underwriting our auto tech program, uh, which will be moving to the new center. We have alumni come in. How do we get a hold of alumni? Through Navience and also contacting our college reps. When we're recruiting is concern and financial aid, all of this stuff. Remember, trying, uh, we're trying to push them up, you're trying to pull them up. We try to reduce every barrier possible. You know, summer bridge programs that we do with HCC in Wharton County, college connections programs similar to what Austin Community College used to do here. Both of them do that at our schools. And the service areas doesn't really matter anymore. We open it up to both institutions, even though we're split down the middle between Wharton County and Houston Community College, they, but we give them both access to whatever schools are in our district. And they, they do college connections at most of those um, schools. What we do, bless you, what we do is try and reduce every barrier possible to a kid getting to school. Um, we're above the state average on kids going to college right out of high school and also within that first and second year. And we hope to continue to do that, but we can't do it without your help. And it, it, it works for us, it works for you guys, and it especially works for the students the closer that we work together. And one of the things I hear over and over and over, and I heard this yesterday at a meeting before I left, um, Houston, one of the biggest barriers, if not the biggest barrier, is financial. Kids are afraid, and parents are afraid to take out student loans. They will um, make a statement that we want to do this without taking out any student loans. And all I have to say about that is doing this without a student loan is almost impossible these days unless you're on a free ride or your parents are rich. Um, when, and when I'm talking to kids, when you get older, you're going to buy a car, probably a new car. You're going to make payments on it. You won't be able to afford it outright. It's going to be a necessity to have transportation, to get to work and whatever. When you get older, you're going to buy a house. You may pay on that house for 20 or 30 years. It's an investment. What is wrong with taking out a reasonable amount of money, loans, for a college education? It's a necessity today, and it's an investment. You know, the return you're going to get on a forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 student loan, the return is going to far outweigh that amount of money plus interest. So when you put it to them that way, they still don't want to do it with, with student loans. It's not inconceivable to have to do that because you have to do that in today's society with buying a house or buying a car or buying anything that's large. The thing about a college education is it's a heck of an investment. Um, not going to cover this. I've already talked about this. We have you guys come in and do a lot of presentations for us on financial aid, and we appreciate that because we only know so much about it. I've learned a whole lot more since I've been on this committee about what I didn't know. Last thing, one of the most honest and promising statements I've ever heard from a student, and this was actually what I, and I hear it in different forms, but I have absolutely no clue what I want to do compared to the student that says, I'm going to be a forensic scientist, you know, or I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. I wonder where did you get this from? But I have absolutely no clue what I want to do after I graduate high school, but I do know I'm going to college. That's the most promising statement I can hear because they're honest in that they have no idea what they want to do. And all their friends say, well, I'm going to be, you know, a surgeon. I don't know what I'm going to be, but I know I'm going to college. That gives me hope, and they're being honest. And it's like, I can work with that. That's it. It's been a little longer than I want to on that, but questions? Can you tell I love my district? Hey, Terry, thank you for presenting that.
do you think 2011 is that the earliest you can go back no we can go back further it won't fit on the page <laughs> what I guess what I'm curious about is it's amazing <coughs> that the peak in the in the number of graduates hmm? You know, doesn't happen until year year seven on this. I mean, I wonder how much does it does it keep going until eight, or is yes. it dro drop off considerably at eight? It 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 keeps going. Um, I've inquired about that because it won't fit on the slide, and I want to know. It only goes up to eight years. The so would slide, you say the peak the slide is, won't scrunch together for some reason? Is the peak at eight years? You think or? Uh, it probably is going to be at seven or eight, but. There's the, you can look at it and see the trend. There's still kids finishing college and still kids that are coming after a stop out, coming back. That's amazing. When you think about it, it may not be that far-fetched. We get um, not kids anymore. We just had one a couple days ago. She graduated 15 years ago or didn't graduate 15 years ago. She was one credit or a half credit short and never got her diploma. And she's been out working and everything, but she came back to the high school and said, what can I do to get this credit or this half a credit to get my diploma? And the rules were different back then. So normally you'd have to go with what those <laughs> rules are. But the rules have changed now for us with IGCs, uh, individual graduation plans, or uh, IGPs. And we basically did what was in the best interest of that student who is now, you know, close to 35 years old. So I went back to college. I didn't finish my bachelor's degree till I was 32. I won't tell you what I did before that, it, but I worked. Um, and didn't get a master's degree until many years later and didn't get a doctorate until I was 50. So I, education is not one of those things that you do immediately after high school and finish as fast as you can. For a lot of people, it's something that happens over a period of time. Life occurs and plans get postponed. So, so on that, you know, idea that students take a long time to graduate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we work a lot within higher ed. How can we graduate students on time? Get them through or whatever. You have a different perspective, so I mean, from where you said, I mean, any thoughts about what higher education is doing right to help students get their degrees in whatever timeline it is, and what could we be doing better? Um, you know, it, and degrees are, you know, requiring more and more um, academic things, components to, to get through a degree. It, it's hard to answer that because I'm not in higher ed. Um, I know that what we do in P12 um, is, is just try and reduce every barrier we possibly can to get that kid to graduate. And I would imagine that at higher ed, there's those same barriers. Um, every one of those kids that walks on your campus has some baggage pack somewhere. And, you know, sometimes the bags are very light and not a whole lot in them. Others, they've got tons of baggage. Identifying what the students' needs are it, outside of academics, social, emotional needs, and I know ca uh, counselors are readily available at all institutions that I'm familiar with. Um, that is so important because there's so many things that can interfere with a student's education that have nothing to do with education. So addressing those, and speaking as a counselor for a long time, you have to address those or the academics don't matter because they won't make it. I just want to say I appreciate everything that y'all are doing at your school district. That's, that's very good. And I appreciate the presentation today. Can you tell me a little bit about the HARN and like are these employees of the district? Are there volunteers? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? They are the recruiters for these individual schools and they just most of them happen to have a rep in the Houston area like UT Austin is up here but Veronica Pena one of our uh, reps for UT Austin we currently don't have one just for us in Fort Bend we're so big we think we need to have our own um, but she'll participate she'll come out she'll do UT night but she's part of that horn that horn organization 
And I know I can shoot an email to her or call her, and she will return it that day and say, what do you need? Do I need to come out? You know, do you have a group I need to speak to? And that's what HARN does. Um, it's kind of a coalition of college reps that serve that Houston area, but they serve Fort Bend as well. Um, it, it's like a little gang of college reps that travel. That's through. what I was trying to figure out. If it, I thought it was recruiters from universities, but I wasn't <laughs> sure. So thank you for clarifying. Yeah, it's not alumni. It's it's the actual recruiters, but it's a very well organized program, and it's run by Guy Grenard out of UT Dallas. Yeah. Any any other questions, concerns, comments? Thank you, Terry. Thanks. Appreciate it. I, I love showing off our district. <laughs> <laughs> to Lisa. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to look at my phone a little bit because I have notes on here. Um, so from the Texas Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, um, just a quick update on some things. Um, we talked about Senate Bill 499 today, and um, we were able as TASFA to support the bill. Um, I think we knew somewhat coordinating board stance on it in the intent. Um, I think the issue was there was still confusion amongst some institutions and so forth is like, is it, are they included or are private loans not included? So anyway, we're, we were able to write a letter. Um, I did s submit that. Uh, um, Zelma and um, Allen have led the legislative committee this year, did a fabulous job, and Jimmy Parker has been a part of that as well. Um, so um, did write a letter and send up to support a, a Senate Bill 499, and then I was able to go to the Capitol um, when the House uh, committee was having a hearing on that, as well as Jimmy Parker and Chris Murr. Um, and so um, there was some kind of hijacking that came along, if you know, at the last minute, but still things got approved. I think it was Senate Bill 249, is that right? SB 249, I can't remember the number. But the clarification is out there currently um, that there is no intent basically for alternative loans. It's basically what you're able to provide and what you have easy access to. Um, and we know that many of us have, in, you know, not all the information for all student loans for, for each student. Um, this past spring, a uh, task for regional training for the first time presented NASFA credentialing um, at our regional trainings. Um, the subject was satisfactory academic progress. Um, one of the initiatives this year uh, was to provide NASFA credentialing at that venue. Um, and so the regional training committee was able to do that. And uh, based on the attendees, I think that they were very happy to have credentialing available during that venue as well. Um, last year was our first year to offer NASPA credentialing um, on specific topics. Um, it could be cost of attendance, which we talked about today. It could be satisfactory academic progress. It could be verification or return to Title IV funds. But we were able to provide um, two sessions at the beginning of our conference last year, and they were very well attended as well. I've been working with the Task for Early Awareness Committee. Um, you know, we've been meeting about once a month. Um, this year, the committee, one of the things I charged them with is, you know, to try to increase the number of high schools, um, the counselors that take advantage of training that TASFA can provide. Um, and so, um, what we're doing now and next steps are we are finalizing a presentation and we've kind of tailored the presentation two ways this year. Um, so some um, high schools want us to come in and the counselors want a very a smaller, shorter type of presentation. Um, and sometimes we go and we do longer presentations that are more of a workshop type thing. So we've been able to accommodate that. Um, with that, we are working on certificates that we'll be able to provide um, to the participants. But we'll be sending something out soon on the listserv and we want um, universities, colleges to help um, secure sites for next year for us to have available for task for trainers to go out um, to um, do workshops for high school counselors. Um, for those of you who work in the high schools, you know, we also, um, if you have, we do know that sometimes there's training that's provided even during the year. And if we can come and be a part of that for an hour of professional development or so, then we're welcome to do that. And we do have the ability to tailor our presentation where I think it would be enough for 
the high school counselors, but at least give them some information rather than none and to answer questions that they may have. Um, and so we're working on that as well, so more to come. And the fall conference is a committee has been busy at work um, and soon they'll be sending out a request for presentations for the fall conference, which will be October the 9th through 11th in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and so our theme is, um, I know Nora's listening from afar and she's gonna go, Delisa, you should remember that, but I think it's denim dollars and decreasing debt. So um, I hope that all of you will be able to attend the conference. And so one of the things new this year is we will have an aspiring director's track um, at the conference. One of the initiatives this year was to try to provide, that I had wanted is to, to pro provide um, a little bit more training to those in our profession um, who want to continue in our profession. And we do need uh, people to continue in the profession. Um, as we see a lot of our young workforce come in for a couple, two or three years and, and they're off to something else. Um, but we want to provide some training um, at the state level um, for those who want to aspire to be a director to give them more to take back and continue to work on um, increasing their skills, knowledge and working in the profession for a long term. So, um, so anyway, that's kind of what we've got going on at present. Okay. Thank you very much. Comments? Okay, hearing none on our last, well, second to last agenda item, Chad. So most everything <laughs> that I'd usually talk about has already been covered today. Um, so just a couple quick highlights. Um, you probably noticed, uh, but NetPice calculator is out there, I guess. It's, I don't know how to describe it, but you can do what you need to do now with NetPice calculator, so that's out there. Um, and we've done a couple things with our um, loan program. Um, I had mentioned to you on several previous um, meetings, but we did implement the credit card processing fee. Um, uh, that went into effect on May 17th um, so that we could focus those costs on individuals who choose to use that option as opposed to spreading those costs across all borrowers. Um, we did implement the new um, Cal interest rate uh, as of May 1st. So for Cal that are certified on or after May 1st, uh, the um, interest rate was reduced from 5.3 down to 5.2. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we do keep it as low as we possibly can. Uh, I don't know if they specifically mentioned, it was in the um, handout, but I don't know if Lizette said out loud the fact that the work that um, Ken Martin did with our bonding authority not only ensured that we have enough authority um, to meet demand um, for the foreseeable future, um, but also was able to provide mechanisms in terms of the timing of when bonds need to be issued, et cetera, um, that are, is gonna allow us to save about $4 million a year in unnecessary interest payments so that we don't have to be issuing the bonds and sitting on the money. Um, we have more time to be able to get it right before we need it. Um, so that's gonna help us keep interest rates um, low as well. Um, and then we've done some internal pieces to, to make things flow internally. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention was um, we are looking at, um, we're assessing the potential of eliminating the process that we currently have um, of placing uh, academic holds uh, for delinquent students. Um, there was legislation uh, that passed this session um, that addressed uh, occupational license holds. Um, and so the occupational license holds have been are effective September 1st. Um, that has been removed. So if you're in default on a loan, um, your license is not going to be held. Um, we're also looking at potentially um, removing the academic holds that we place for students that are delinquent um, on their loans. Um, so we're currently in the investigation on that um, and we'll be um, working with schools as to what that might look like if we approach that. So wanted to let you know that that's a piece we're looking at. Um, and then um, we are going to have uh, some future, in terms of future topics for this meeting, um, I am looking at following up on the idea from the last meeting about having someone come in to talk about chatbots um, and the chatbot that's being launched um, at the agency and things like that. So you can have those details. 
Um, and also wanted to check in, one of the ideas um, we have um, that was suggested was talking more about um, the Pell Grant pilot that's going on with dual credit students um, and potentially just dual credit um, broadly um, and whether that might be a topic that you all would be interested in hearing more about. Is that something that I'm seeing heads nod so that's something that I'll look into as well um, is getting that onto a future agenda. So that wraps it up for me. Oh. I'm just going to tell everybody. Go Lawrence is going to be so annoyed. I'm getting married. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's really my big excitement. So and uh, the big date is uh, I, assuming we get a venue October 20th. So I have four months to pull this all together. So I am so getting in trouble if anyone tells Lawrence that I told you all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so before I ask for a motion to adjourn, there's one thing I did want to say, and that is um, thank you to uh, your staff for all the work that has gone into on that you've got done on the monthly updates. They have been very well received, I know, on a lot of campuses. So thank you very, very much for that. I'm sorry, what, Leah? And there is one on Tuesday, so we will put a plug out. Be sure. May I have a motion to adjourn? So move. I'm, I'm sorry, what? It's all about so fads on Tuesday. Okay. And I think, Paul, was that you that so moved or Ed? Mm -hmm. Paul, it okay. Is. Second? And congratulations to Ted. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. <laughs>